Well, and here's the fucked up thing too is that he says the pet, but the you know I was expecting to get in all kind of trouble, but the pastor forgave me, and I'm like, he's not the one you stole the fucking candy from. It's not his yes, candy. You're right. <laughs> it is. It is, however, the perfect metaphor for Christianity, you're right, though. Where it's like, <laughs> I harmed another person, and I just don't want to feel bad about it. And the pastor's like, poof, magic, yep. don't feel bad about it. And he's like, oh, yeah, <laughs> oh, wow, I guess that I, was, that's much better now. <laughs> I guess I could just stop feeling bad about it. God awful movie. 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 Welcome back to the Gamcast, where each week we sample another selection from Christian Cinema because it's still better than Kirsten Cinema. And I'm your host, Bill <laughs> Illusions. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I know it fucks up the intro, but that was great. <laughs> Thanks. I have no illusions. He's going to be unable to join us today, but sitting 900 miles to my northeast is my bad friend, Eli Bosnick. Eli, how are you this fine afternoon, sir? I'm fantastic, you unappreciated gem, you. Thank you. Thank you. And also joining us tonight is just masochist Kara Santa Maria. <laughs> Kara, it's great to have you back. It's been too long. <laughs> At two, it has two launch, two launch. <laughs> Just doing whatever we want with war our cheese now. Okay, continues behind the scenes and puzzle and <laughs> thunderstorm. So sad, you guys. Twenty twenty four. Just like a, a sniffly crying episode that we never explain. <laughs> 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 All right. So tell us, Kara, what will we be breaking down today? Oh, I don't even know what that was. <laughs> 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 this is you guys somehow figure out each time to put me in more and more pain okay <laughs> so let's see i didn't do any research on it because why would i waste no. any more of my life hours <laughs> the internet has nothing to say about this oh good movie, yeah there wasn't even a rotten tomatoes there was like some other metric that i had never heard of when i googled it yeah so you get it's like rotten cum quats or something it's like the generic version <laughs> <laughs> i will tell you what eli said it was and which actually got me excited. And then I realized that he's a mean, mean liar pants. He said, quote, it's called Only God Can. And it's about five girl besties and their quest to stop having jobs and lives and love Jesus. Okay. Um, I think I nailed I, it. I think he pretty much nailed it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's four besties by the end. Spoiler. but <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> Like the original ads for South Park or whatever. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, Eli, how bad was this movie? Well, if you've ever used the phrase, me and my girls, have a poem about family crocheted somewhere in a frame in your house, <laughs> and you'd like to speak to the manager, <laughs> you will love this movie. If getting sent home for your skirt not being longer than your fingers when they're at your sides was a movie, it would be only <laughs> God can. <laughs> so bad. All right. So now I will say, though, this was bad in a delightful way, right? This I was disagree. <laughs> <laughs> like, OK. All right. This was bad in as delightful a way as any movie we ever review on this show. <laughs> oh, I see. Yes. This is a context. Badness. Exactly, That's exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Relatively speaking. Yeah. All right, so is there anything we want to nominate this one for being the best at being the worst at? Well, yes. Okay, so my best worst, by the way, has to do with what I think this movie was actually about and why it was actually so sinister and not at all how Eli so saccharinely described it. <laughs> so for me, this movie was the best worst white supremacist tame the black savage movie yes. dressed yeah. up as a playful romp about a girly weekend away. Oh, the casualness with which white supremacy <laughs> permeates this fucking rom-com so is terrifying it, you yes. remember if you've ever read like man in the high castle where you get like a glimpse of what tv's like when the nazis win or whatever yeah. that's this movie <laughs> this movie <laughs> is like an alternate it's it's a four minute clip from an alternate well, history <laughs> that's what's so fucked up about it it's not even just the way the fact that there's so much white supremacy permeating the film it's that they're so unaware of it yeah oh it's oh. so secondary they they like own it in a weird way. Yeah. It's, see, I think that they're fully aware of it. I thought that, like, at least one of the writers or, you know, the executive producer was like, hmm, 
I'm going to sneak this in there. Like, to me, there were so many dog whistles in this movie. To okay. The oh. Yeah, no, there was definitely a punch it up with some more racism feel to yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, but bring it right up to the line so that most of the dumb people watching the movie won't be aware of right, it. Right, exactly. That's the trick. Or, or so that you have plausible deniability later. Yes, you know? yes, 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 yes. All right, so I was going to go with best worst use of a tourism bureau's money. Now, I don't know that the Charleston, South Carolina Tourism Bureau paid any amount of money at all for this movie, but I feel like they had to because there are so many superfluous establishing shots of what a lovely city Charleston is. It's like <laughs> a big city and a small town all at once. And like every time we move from anywhere to anywhere, I could, the whole fucking movie takes place in South Carolina, right? With the exception of one scene in Atlanta. So we have to keep we keep showing like city establishing shots to remind us we're still in Charleston. <laughs> and they also say the word. Char I feel like if we had the script in front of us and we control F. Yeah. The word Charleston would show up so many times. Like, it's so unnecessary to reference where you are that many times in a movie. Yeah. Unless you're taking money from the Tourism Bureau. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I have a feeling that every small town has one movie that they just threw their <laughs> way behind. I know Binghamton's, like, every small town gets together once a generation and they're like, damn it, we're getting a Hallmark movie. <laughs> <laughs> Write them that $1,200 check, Joe. It's been worth the 10 years of saving. <laughs> and I was going to go with best worst alcoholism. Oh, Ooh, steep, yeah, steep yeah. competition in this one. Yeah. yeah. Spoiler alert. This movie is about each of these five friends turning Christian or dead one by one. <laughs> and, <laughs> or both or both. Or both. Yeah, yeah sometimes both. they do. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> the final holdout is going to be what the makers of this movie think an alcoholic is. And she might as well be shooting paint thinner into her veins throughout this thing. I found her level of drinking unbelievable, and I just spent a week with Heath and Andrew Torres. Right. I really... I know. Yeah. To be fair, I think that she was the most delightful part of the whole thing. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. She warmed right. my heart. Yep, up until the last seven minutes when they fucked her character up by making her Christian. Yeah, she was I great. I sneezed and forgot about that part. Okay, so. all right. Yeah, <laughs> all right, well, I'll tell you what. Nothing happens to this movie, so we've got plenty of time for a break. But when we come back, we'll dive into all the random backstory discussions that are only God can. Oh, man, Kara, that smells amazing. Is that bacon? Not just any bacon, Noah. That's bacon from Moink. What's Moink? Moink delivers grass-fed and grass-finished beef and lamb, pastured pork and chicken, and wild-caught Alaskan salmon direct to your door. Their animals are raised outdoors, their fish swim wild in the ocean, and Moink meat is free of antibiotics, hormones, sugar, and all the other junk you find prepackaged in the meat aisle. That sounds and smells awesome. It is. And when you sign up at moinkbox.com slash awful to get a year of bacon for free, and then you get to pick what meats you want delivered with your first box, change what you get each month and cancel any time. So you got that bacon for free. I sure did. And you can have some if you just say moink's catchphrase. I mean, sure. Let me see the paper. Wow, that must be really, really good bacon. It is no illusions. So do you want some or not? Ah. Uh. Oink, oink. I'm just so happy I got moinked. Uh, sorry. <clears throat> Couldn't quite make that out. One more time. Oink, oink. I'm so happy that I got moinked. And you will be too. Here you go. <laughs> Join the moink movement today. Go to moinkbox.com slash awful right now. And listeners to this show get free bacon for a year. That's one year of the best bacon you'll ever taste, but for a limited time. Spelled M-O-I-N-K box dot com slash awful. That's moinkbox.com slash awful. Worth it, right? Oh, so worth it. All right, gang. So I'm super excited to announce that we're going to be joined by actual lady person, Kara Santa Maria, for our writer's meeting about our upcoming project, Only God Can. Kara, thanks for coming. Um, for the record, I'm only here because someone I know spray painted. It's pronounced GIF on the side of my car, and I need this gig to get it fixed. Yeah, whatever brings you in. So we want only God can to reflect the real experiences and struggles of women. Yeah, like struggles of having an affair with a professor in China who turns out to be an international con man. Or being black. Falling in love with your hunky single pastor. 
I'm sorry, did you just say that being black is a is a struggle that women face? Well, the black ones do. Yeah, I sure did. <sighs> Tell me. I'm sorry, what'd you say? Uh, oh, I, I, I was just... No, 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 shut up, 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 shut up. That's perfect. One of them will die. People come to Jesus all the time when people they care about die. Oh, that's, they, that's true. They do. That's great work, Kara. I need a drink. And one of them will be an alcoholic, too. This girl's unstoppable. I am so glad we hired you. I'm going to kill Heath. <laughs> and we're back for the breakdown. And in a foreboding preview of how bad the audio mixing is going to be in this movie, <laughs> the music in the production logo clips. <laughs> okay. So most recently I've had to watch these movies with these wireless headphones that attach to my TV because either my baby is asleep or my baby's in the room and I don't want him exposed to Christian cinema. Mm -hmm. So I always have to run over to my computer and double check that the sound is really this bad and my son <laughs> headphones haven't killed themselves. But yeah, that had happened to me several times throughout watching this Ooh. film. Oh, I had to have the remote in my hand the whole time because it would <laughs> vacillate between... People talking like this, so you don't understand what they're saying because they're talking so quietly. And the loudest music cues you've ever oh, heard in your yep. life. I mean, it like hurt my brain. The <laughs> music was at 13. The dialogue was at four. The sound effects were at nine. It was bizarre. <laughs> and I, the dialogue was at four when it was at its best. There were times when the dialogue was literally at zero. Yeah, yep. yeah. Or like there was something weird about how they tracked it. I don't know. Like sometimes the dialogue, yeah, not only could you not understand it, it, it's either because the data wasn't there or it was like tracked over itself. There's something odd. Yeah, going there on. was like a, like it, it sounded at the beginning in this very first scene with Coley that the left and right stereo tracks were off by a hundredth of a second. <laughs> it, it had that robotic weirdness. Going. It was bizarre. Anyway, so we start off with my best worst 700 tourist bureau shots of beautiful <laughs> Charleston, South Carolina. And I just want to point this out because Charleston is such an unremarkable city that there is no thing they can show, right? Like if you right. most cities, you can say, oh, well, there's the Washington Monument. Oh, well, there's the New York City skyline. Oh, there's one of the many familiar landmarks in L.A. or whatever. But with Charleston, they have to show a sign that says, welcome to Charleston. <laughs> yeah. And they don't even have a good one of those. It's just the green and white sign by some shitty six lane highway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They've got two different shots of the Chipotle. Yeah. So you think they've got two? <laughs> Damn it. We lost that bidding war to Kudoba, but otherwise, this montage is perfect. <laughs> also, I want to point out that this movie will begin with the quote, Judge not lest ye be judged, when the entire film is about being a judgy bitch to your friends yep. until they become Christian. Absolutely. True. Absolutely. It's, it's judge. Not what's the opposite of not? Yeah, <laughs> extra. <laughs> judge, yes, judge always. Super. So okay, so we open up on this character Coley, who is I think all of our favorite. No, oh, for sure. Oh, we're at the yeah. center of this. So Coley is radically overdoing some invitations. Oh, yeah, yeah. she's spraying all of them with perfume. Mm -hmm. So. This poor actress right. has sprayed now perfume a million times in this little tiny room. I can only imagine she's gagging in between every take. It would smell so bad in there. Yeah. Also, can I just say it's a weird move to spray a party invitation with perfume? Like, I get it for love letters or ransom notes when you want someone to really <laughs> know you mean it. But party invitation, it's a weird move. A bit weird. It, uh, true. Yeah, true. So, yeah, so she hands those off. She's apparently super wealthy. She hands those off to her driver, Grady, to mail off. And this is where we hear the absolute worst the audio is ever going to be. Like, if the rest of the movie's audio was this bad, I would have had just, like, turned the sound off and, and read the subtitles. Right. Oh, I wrote that. I was like, if this whole movie is going to sound like this, I can't do this, you guys. Why are you doing this to me? <laughs> right. Right. It gets better. And I, I almost feel like it's they put this intentionally at the end. So, like, from this point on, we could be like, all right, well, comparatively, the audio is <laughs> yeah. OK, right? <laughs> yeah. All right. So now we cut to the Garden Chapel Mega Church, where our main character, Sarah, is receiving her perfumed invitation. Mm -hmm. And this is where we meet Pastor Hot Rocks. 
Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's their nickname for him. And Actually, it's Hot Rod because his name is Rodney, but I like Hot Rocks better. Oh, yeah. Hot Rod. But yeah, he... Yeah, um, you can understand it because the audio was oh, right, so yeah, bad. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it took me so long to get Coley's name because Coley is not a name for a human being. <laughs> I was like, is her name fucking Goalie? Is her name Goalie? <laughs> it's the name of the the writer, of the screenwriter, Colette. It's short for Colette. Uh, but yeah, I had a, I, I had subtitles on because the audio was so goddamn bad. It made a lot easier. Oh, that's actually a really good idea. So at this point, this is where we meet, yes, the creepy pastor who's extra creepy and the main character, question mark, Sarah. Yep. Yeah. I feel like she's the main character because yeah, they make so. her somehow flawless. Yes. Except for... Her insane lip injection. Thank <laughs> you. Which, like, like, absolutely, first scene, can't stop looking at them. She has those weird lip injections where they only put filler on the sides of her For upper sure lip, did. but not in the middle. Later in my notes, I have like, did she get one of those like hair lip surgery fixings no. and it went wrong? No, no, it's just it's just bad surgery. lip injections where where like her top lip looks like an infinity symbol. <laughs> like that's the shape mm -hmm. of her top lip and I can't not and they put her they put her in so much lip gloss yes. in every scene I can't every not scene. look at them yeah they might as well have like fucking John Madden arrows drawn on the screen <laughs> yes. to her lips yes. in every fucking right. scene yeah they've got yes. nothing else blurred out but her lips yeah and I wanted to highlight one other thing that you said there the, the creepy pastor so in any other movie, this guy is the creepy boss or something like that. The guy who's way too handsy or whatever. This movie seems to think he's charming and adorable because this actor is just a fucking creeper and thinks that this is charming and adorable, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. And also everybody who made this movie and is watching this movie is Christian. And they have like this weird layer on their judgment. <laughs> like it's it's legitimately the weirdest thing. He's not attractive. He says all the wrong things. Yep. Like, so basically the whole, and this scene sets up the premise of the movie, which is Sarah can't decide if she wants to go hang out with her friends. Mm -hmm. And so she's having a moral conundrum and goes to the church to ask her pastor about it. Yes. How is that a concept for a movie? <laughs> so, mm -hmm. Like, I was so confused by this whole scene. And he's like, hmm, hmm, I'm listening intently to this really privileged problem. And yeah. meanwhile, the woman who works at the church is like, Pastor, I'm sorry, but you have a phone call from a dying woman. Would you like to take it? Or do you want to keep talking to this dumb bitch about her non-problem? Right. Well, so her whole fucking issue is like... Me and my college friends get together every year for a reunion, but they're not very Christian and I don't know if I should go. And as she's explaining her first world white lady problems, she literally she's like, and my friends are here are my friends names and a brief character bio about each of their major <laughs> attributes. Right. Oh, yeah. We couldn't afford opening credits from an 80s sitcom. So how about I do this? <laughs> And literally, that's the depth of the character development of yes. every character. She's like, my one friend, she has a women's shelter. It's all you need to know about her. My other friend is black. That's her personality. <laughs> yeah, and she literally says this, this sentence. Yes. She thinks white men have suppressed society. What? So clearly the writers of this movie don't even understand yes. progressive activism or feminism or anti-racism. They don't get it. And then he literally goes, but don't we? Wink, wink. Yeah. That's not charming. That's fucking creepy. Oh. Yep. Yeah. So very quickly, Gracie is newly Christian and she's a mom and she's just great. Coley is fun, but she has a drinking problem. Patrice is black. That's her personality. Her conflict is melanin. <laughs> yes, yes. And just one other thing about Patrice. They will constantly talk about how Patrice is like one of them. She never, ever mentions her blackness. Other people mention it to her <laughs> yeah, constantly. Yeah, all the time. Patri yeah. I kept waiting for Patrice to bring up her color. Not once in the movie. <laughs> nope. And then, and then finally, Glenn is some haughty bitch who thinks that doing good deeds is enough to be a good person, even if you're not their religion. I love it. Another quote, direct quote from the movie. She thinks that doing good deeds gets you into heaven. And literally, they're like, what a dumb cunt. Yes! Yep. Yes. <laughs> yep. 
oh, so, but the pastor's like, well, why are these people even your friends? And she's like, you know, because it was college, man. Don't, let us not make us go into detail. Yeah, yeah. and then she, <laughs> she gives some history that I can't remember because she's the most boring yes. character ever. She's basically like, I was like a person and I took classes and <laughs> there were there were birds and I didn't know. And trees. But then now I'm Christian and he literally is like, you have an amazing testimony. Yes. <laughs> I was like, what? Is he trying to get in her pants? Like, I want to get in yes. testimony, girl. Give me testimony. <laughs> it's, yes. it's that fucking boring testimony that every first world Christian woman has, right? Where they're like, in college, I blew a guy once in the back of a sedan but then when I met my boyfriend that I was going to marry, I decided I was pure as the newest driven snow. And that's my gritty backstory. No. I'm yeah. Sin City, too. And you're just like, oh, my God, I don't care. <laughs> I don't care how many hand jobs you gave while you were wine drunk. I don't <laughs> care. <laughs> this is not a personality. And there's this fucking phenomenal moment she has. Where she's like, and when they all get together, as you Italians would say, <laughs> forget about it. And as if that's not offensive enough, the pastor then immediately corrects her. He's like, hey, 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 I'm not a fucking wop. I'm Portuguese. <laughs> Which, by the and way. And then the movie just moves on. Yeah, it makes it's a completely unnecessary yeah. line. But yeah. also, by the way, that man is not Portuguese. No. Nope. No. <laughs> he's not. There's no reason for that to be in the movie. No, it just makes no sense. Yeah. So ultimately, she decides she's going to go hang out with her sinful friends anyway. And the pastor is going to watch her two sons while she's gone. He's going to babysit for the weekend. Oh, yeah. That's apparently necessary. Yeah. You know, information. Yeah. So this is a <laughs> horror movie really. from the kids. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> So, okay, so a couple of beautiful establishing shots of Charleston, South Carolina. Later, uh, we cut to the union, reunion, which is going to happen. Apparently, Coley, her ex-husband is rich and she lives in this giant beach mansion. Mm -hmm. I love the beginning of this scene because before the establishing shots are over, we hear the, the characters chanting like, uh, you love the pastor or something like that to Sarah. Mm hmm. So before the scene begins, it has already failed the Bechdel test. <laughs> yes. Got to get that out there because they're like, uh oh, we wrote a movie about five women with problems talking to each other. Let's make sure the first one's about a man. Yes. Yeah. And the first one needs to be and about and a man. And the, the last one. one and and the last one. Of the one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> And I love to, not only is it, you love the pastor, you love the pastor, it's also, your kids are assholes. Yeah, also. <laughs> it's like they're all taunting yes. her about having asshole children. Why would anybody want to watch your kids if they're not fucking you? Your kids suck. It's <laughs> <That's> really <laughs> terrible. <laughs> and also, so Coley's got this, like, comically oversized martini glass with an umbrella. Yep. I, like Throughout the movie, she's going to have ever more inappropriate drinking vessels. By the end of it, I expect <laughs> her to have a giant wooden stein like a fucking movie Viking. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. And there's always one touch wrong with it, right? So in this case, she's got a martini glass with an umbrella at brunch. Uh, <laughs> later on, she'll have like straight up vodka out of a fucking... Swizzle straw. It's just <laughs> the worst. It's like if children were right. It, have you guys ever seen that that show, Kid Snippets, on YouTube? No. Oh my God, it's so good. It's like where they record kids talking about things that they have no understanding about, and then adult actors act it out over the over <laughs> Oh, yeah. I gotta check yep. that out. It's so AKA good. AKA Christian cinema. Yes! I guess. Yes! It is. It's so that. <laughs> They're like, what does an alcohol cup look like? <laughs> <laughs> so stupid. <laughs> All right. So, yeah. So we, we do establish here that uh, uh, Patrice is like, oh, you know, that pastor's no good because he's a man, a white man. And then, yeah, that's, you yeah. know, that's we, we've, we've played to her character. Also, Glenn, who is the bitch who thinks that doing good deeds is enough to be a good person. We see that she's getting texts from a guy named Mark. Now, I'm going to cue you in real quick. The movie takes its fucking time on this. She's married and not to a guy named Mark. Okay, yeah, right. That's true. We don't get that right away. Nope. She's having an emotional affair. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> also, I'm 
very unclear at this point why Glenn is friends with any of these motherfuckers. Why I'm, are I'm unclear any, why any of them are yeah, friends with any of them? None of them have anything in common nope. and they're all awful. Yeah. Well, so I wrote later in my notes, I'm like, you know, you can only hang out with the old friends that you like, right? They don't have to all come in the group they used to be in. <laughs> So, so Glenn goes to walk off and Grace, this is the, the newly Christian girl that we learned about at the beginning. Don't worry. She doesn't matter much. Not yeah, no. much. No. The one with the target on her forehead. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so she turns to Glenn and she says, Hey, I hear your son is in the army. Are you praying for him to Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior? And Glenn's like, okay. Like she should be. <laughs> Which I want to point out to an absolutely devout Christian, that is still a weird question. <laughs> <laughs> if you were the deepest of believers and someone's like, oh, my son's going into the military, they were like, yeah, you're probably asking God not to kill him, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's my first response to your news. <laughs> well, and then she walks away. Like Grace turns to Sarah, the main character, and she goes, Oh, I probably I came on a little strong, didn't I? And Sarah's like, no, not at all. No, you know, you fucking nailed that. <laughs> no, that was great. That's our whole thing. <laughs> it's just wedging our religion into every possible conversation in the least pleasant way. You nailed it. You nailed yeah. it. Yep, it great. <laughs> yep, 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 yep. So, OK. So meanwhile, Patrice and Coley, that's the 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 black woman and the drunk woman are. Yeah. Hanging out in the kitchen. I've just described all of their personalities. I it's, wasn't it's referring true. to her I mean, race you're not. Yet. Yeah, they yeah. did that for us. Yeah, like, we, exactly. They're not. Yeah. This is where we learned that Patrice is an author. A poet. Yeah. Uh -huh. A poet. A poet. Yes. Which is also an author. No offense, Eli's mom. That's also. Yeah. A, she's also <laughs> right, an author, right. too. But specifically, she writes poetry. Yeah. Right. And this is where Coley says, Psh, book of poems. They didn't even rhyme. <laughs> and I genuinely could not tell you if this movie thinks poems should rhyme. Or <laughs> <laughs> so and then, of course, since they're so good at capturing audio, they've decided that they're going to have a whole fucking scene where Gracie and Sarah are standing on a goddamn beach being oh, okay. drowned so out by the sound of the surf bonding over their Christianity. Did they record the audio from inside a conch? Yes, that, I think they did. I that think. would make sense. <laughs> Ooh, and the conversation is so banal. It's like, speaking of divorce, you're divorced. Would you like to expound on that element of your backstory, Sarah? <laughs> oh, there's such a fucking amazing moment here in the middle of this conversation where she's like, oh, I was so Christian and he had an affair. It's maybe I wasn't good enough. And then there's an echoey fucking silence while her friend does not disagree. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, OK, but she goes like, you know, my, my husband left me because she he said I was a Christian zealot. And the last straw for him is when I wanted to keep our kids out of school so I could hide them from evolution in the age of the earth. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And it's like, sure, reasonable. Mm -hmm. yep. I would have left you too. Yeah, and well, then they have to back away from that. She's like, oh, so he was having an unrelated affair even before I was Christian. So it's not Jesus' <laughs> fault. It's he's <laughs> such a bad person. Fault. Yep, yep. He also used his computer too much. I don't know why I'm listing all the things <laughs> I didn't like. This is a weird order for me. <laughs> and then after Sarah, main character, talks about all of her non-problems, then Grace... The character who doesn't matter you, soon you'll see blonde pretty girl mm -hmm. is like like kind of ugly crying at this yep. point right yep. about how she loves jesus and everything was hard in her life except none of her problems are real problems she's like i have kids who love me <laughs> and life is sometimes slightly stressful my yoga class got canceled and you're just like what is this <laughs> like what these people don't matter she yep. ugly cries almost every conversation that she has in this in this movie it's pretty amazing honestly you do too matter could have been the title of this movie <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> or my life is harder than your life, comma, black lady. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so we go straight from Sarah's weepy backstory about her husband leaving her to Gracie's weepy backstory about her dad leaving her when she was a kid. And then, oh, is that what she was talking about? Yeah, she starts yeah. talking about like uh, her, her, her dad left one day and she waited on the porch for him for 
apparently the rest of her fucking life. You know. Oh I don't- <laughs> yeah, it was so funny. <laughs> she literally, it's it was like that movie trope where she's like, he went out for cigarettes yep. and never came back. That's yep. the extent of the writing ability. Like I don't, I don't mean to like make light of people who whose fathers left them. I know that's very traumatic or whatever. No, it's but terrible. The way like, that they this stupid, it. yeah, exactly. The way this yeah. stupid ass movie stumbles over it is hilarious. But so she's like, yeah, and I, you know, I always felt like my father had abandoned me, and I didn't have a father and then i found the holy father yeah oh Oh, i hate that why is there always an electra complex in all these movies (laughs) yeah where it's like jesus is also daddy and i want to fuck jesus but also my absent daddy like i want to study these people right yeah no he's in my and the holy spirit is within me and he's the trinity yeah yeah, and he's mm-hmm. got a big fat cock too. <laughs> yeah, she literally ends it by saying, "That's the hole you felt like you could never fill." And I wrote in my notes, <laughs> "Yes, the Eli Bosnick story." I get it, girl. I get it. <laughs> All right, but we cut now to a scene where Gracie has gone inside and she's admiring the entire room full of childhood beauty pageant trophies that Coley keeps. Sure. Yeah. Who? Do- it's a whole wall of this yes. room that's got built-in bookshelves with like tiaras and sashes and trophies. Like, what adult woman, right, would keep that kind of? It's weird. Well, here's the fucked up thing. Judging by the budget that this movie seemed to have for most things, that is someone's collection involved in the making of this film, right? They just no question. <laughs> for sure. For sure. So, yeah, so Gracie comes in. She's like, oh, these are nice trophies. And then Coley comes in and starts lecturing her on how she should make her daughters compete in beauty pageants. While putting her in clown makeup. Yes. Yeah, she, she, and she literally is like, how is a pageant any different from a track meet? And I'm like, let me tell you. <laughs> like, one of them involves skill and the other yeah. is prioritizing being pretty as if that's a skill. Right. Yeah. yeah, one is a sexy child contest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and the other one is like I don't know, teaches you things like self determination, overcoming adversity. Like it's the weirdest thing ever. And then she's like, literally says to her, "Life is a competition." Like it's very cutthroat. It's making me uncomfortable. Yeah, that's why we didn't mm-hmm. want to have Heath here for this one. He's um, yeah, he's gonna be very triggering. They have this great moment where she's like, "I don't know." When I see that stuff on TV, it makes it look like shit. And she says, everything looks like shit. And I was like, you know what, Coley? You have a point. That's true. You do have a (laughs) point. That's true. Yeah. This is where we start to love Coley. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. This is where we learn that there have been some incidents with Coley at the women's shelter fundraiser. (laughs) Yes. Oh, Oh, yes. And I love this because they reference. So Glenn, her whole thing is that she runs a women's shelter. Yes. Yep. Like, and and apparently that makes her a bad person because she doesn't also have Jesus in her heart. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But- the, clearly, the women's shelter doesn't have a name, so no, they just call no. it the women's shelter. The women's shelter, <laughs> over yeah. Over and over, which is so weird. Not even, they never even shorten it to the shelter. <laughs> no, always the women's Well, you shelter. know, it is South Carolina. There's probably just the one yeah, women's right. shelter. That's probably. That's <laughs> yeah, and so they're literally, like, talking down to her, like, shitting on her for raising money for women who are victimized by violence and then shitting on her drunk friend for donating lots of money to said women children. Yes. Like, like, oh my God, this is what you do with your life? Well, <laughs> so, so weird. And, and that is legitimately what's going on, right? Like Kara's not being facetious in her description of that because the message that this movie is trying to send is, yeah, well, you're never going to get to heaven by, you know, helping victimized women or donating money to charities it's all about being our religion what a fucking waste yeah Yeah, this is clearly a grace not works religion that Mm -hmm. wrote this movie so i mean what are those those are the i don't really know the protestants yeah those are the Protestants. i believe okay i'm not very good at this and even even as somebody like i'm you know, clearly we're all atheists and think this is all garbage. But like, even when I was a kid, I was raised in the Mormon church. And even the Mormon church is a works-based faith. Mm -hmm. Like they believe in all the things like baptism and doing all that stuff. But they're also like, you can't just get baptized and then be a shitty person. 
Like, you also have to be a good person your whole life. Yeah. Otherwise, it doesn't work. <laughs> like, <laughs> but, but clearly, there are lots of people who believe you can just do whatever the fuck you want, act however the fuck you want. And so long as you have Jesus in your heart, you're going to heaven. I mean, this is that Heaven's Gates, Hell's Flames play that we did incarnate. Yep. Yep. Exactly. No, exactly. Ugh. That's a huge part of this movie's message. The acting isn't any better and the set is slightly better dressed. But yep, it's the same fucking movie. It is. Well, and then we we cut back to the goddamn pageant conversation because apparently we didn't get enough of that the first time around. (laughs) And there's this amazing moment here. So Coley is like telling Grace off for being too Christian, right? She's like, you're getting like fucking Sarah and Sarah's just annoying. And she says at this point, don't get me wrong. I believe Jesus died for our sins. I go to church. I just, you know, I'm not also an asshole about it. And the movie's like, see, that's your problem right there. See, that's your problem. You got to be an asshole (laughs) about it. It's so weird. They, they like clearly spell out that she's already Christian. Yeah. Yep. Everyone in this movie is already Christian. Right. They're just not Christian enough for Sarah's (laughs) weird. Bullshit metrics, yes. And the whole movie is going to be ultimately about making Coley the Christian into a fucking Christian. Yep. <laughs> making Cause... everyone in this movie who is already Christian more better Christian. Yes. yes. And and in doing so, don't worry, Jesus will suck the alcoholism right out yep, of your brain. Sure yeah. will. Sure will. That's how that works. So, of course, this conversation about how Christian she is or isn't is ostensibly still about the kids in beauty pageants. So they wrap that part up by having Grace ask, well, you know, if it's about building self-esteem, what if my kids lose the beauty pageants? And Coley's like, well, I wouldn't know about losing. I've never done that. And I'm like, (laughs) fuck yeah, Coley. (laughs) <laughs> fuck yeah Heath would love you <laughs> oh are you kidding a woman who can out drink him and has issues about losing <laughs> his fucking soulmate was on this episode yeah but you're also forgetting the most important part of this scene am I the flashback yeah well, no yeah yeah no we're, we're getting there we're getting there yeah. oh okay yeah. I'm like come on man oh yeah we yeah. get to see her childhood we get to see her uh, Jean Benet Ramsey moment <laughs> and <laughs> it's um you might want to be a little careful about using that expression Kara <laughs> <laughs> We might have very different definitions of what a John Benet Ramsey moment is. Probably true. Sorry, it's the only it's the only pageant child I could think of off the top of my head. That's probably yeah, it's probably it. a, That's li- a like, little bit more. Let's street. not ask Eli how many he can think of. So, oh god, I can think of a lot of pageant children. But my favorite part of this is uh, well, there's so many favorite parts. Oh. So they flash back to her sitting in a trailer with like a stuffed animal while her garbage mom is yelling at her about being a shitty pageant contestant and winning second place and second place is garbage. Mm. And she's like, fuck you. She's second place. <laughs> she's got crazy eyes. And it's so, and also, Drunk Mom is, you guys, okay, I have not seen as many of these bad movies as you have. I only do this once a month. Thank God. <laughs> but the mom is by far the worst acting I've seen Ooh, yet. Yeah, yeah. She, she overplays this by so many degrees. <laughs> It's also Amazing. weird because it it seems like the actress doesn't know when the scene is going to cut. Yeah, yes. she keeps being like never, and then totally relaxing and dropping character, like she expects the scene to be over, and then like oh shit, there's more lines. Uh, and then another thing about that is so weird. It's so weird. She's acting in bursts of TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and she just keeps saying the same things over and over again. Like, it's like the actor instinctively knows that this scene shouldn't be this fucking long. (laughs) But it goes on forever. She just over and over again screams the same shit before storming out of the trailer to sulk and smoke cigarettes, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Clearly, that's what she was doing. All right. Well, I'll tell you what. I I know I need a minute to process all this new character information we just got. So we're going to pause for another break. But we'll be back in a minute with even more. Only God can. But you can buy Hot Pockets by the pallet. It's not about the money, Noah. I've talked to you about this. Hey, hey guys, what are you arguing about? (sighs) We're trying to figure out what to do for food tonight. Noah doesn't want to eat anything but Hot Pockets. And Eli wants to go to a restaurant that only serves mustard. Okay, for the record, Poupon has a Michelin star. Guys, guys, if you want to eat delicious food at home, why don't you try HelloFresh? 
What's HelloFresh? Well, with HelloFresh, you get fresh pre-measured ingredients and mouth-watering seasonal recipes delivered right to your door. Skip trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. Hmm, I don't know, Kara. I like a little variety in what I eat, you know? Well, HelloFresh offers 50 menu and market items to choose from every week, from vegetarian meals and calorie-smart choices to extra-special gourmet options. There's something for everyone to enjoy with recipes designed and tested by professional chefs and nutritional experts to ensure deliciousness and simplicity. Wow, that's a lot of variety, but that's got to be super expensive, right? Actually, HelloFresh is over 30% cheaper than shopping at grocery stores with pre-portioned ingredients that ensure you won't spend money on excess food that ends up going in the trash. Yeah, HelloFresh actually sent us a box to try, and the fact that each recipe comes in its own bag makes unpacking and getting ready for cooking a breeze. All right, Kara, I'm sold. Where do I sign up? Just go to HelloFresh.com slash Awful14 and use code Awful14 for up to 14 free meals, including free shipping. Wait, that's HelloFresh.com slash Awful14? And use code Awful14 for up to 14 free meals, including free shipping? That's right. So, Eli, that place you were going to go the other night was a mustard restaurant? Oh, no, that was a different thing. Same name, though. Confusing. I can see why that confused you. Uh, Gross. Poop on. (laughs) Patrice, thanks so much for coming. Oh, I wouldn't miss it for the world. So wonderful to help women in need. Of course. Is Coley coming? (sighs) She said she was, but I haven't. um... Boom, baby. Sorry. Sorry. Hi, I'm late. Fucking valet took forever. Oh, Coley, we don't have valet parking. Well, then some motherfucker stole my car again, so... Oh, Coley. I may have given my car to someone on accident again. <sighs> Got it. Well, why don't we just sit you down? We can start the silent auction. Hey, hey, I got something silent for you. Coley, that, that wasn't silent. Yeah, well, it wasn't a fart either. Oh, Jesus. Chip myself. We got it. <laughs> and we're back for more of this shit. We're going to open back up on Sarah setting the table for dinner. And yes, her play settings include a Bible for each guest. <laughs> <laughs> now, it'll turn out that they all have a tradition of giving gifts to each other. And this is her gift, which is pretty shitty by itself. But at first, it just seemed like she's like, OK, a spoon for the soup, a fork for the fish, a fork for the meal and a Bible. <laughs> and a Bible for the sin. <laughs> So she's she's setting the table. Coley's making dinner. She starts fucking with her. She's like, apropos of nothing, you're a Christian. Christian, Christian, Christian. (laughs) You're too Christian. I always love the moment where these movies try to do like a make fun of themselves thing. Right. It's like it's like when you're trying to do a roast of a friend and you've got to see how hard you can go. Mm -hmm. Right. Right? They're like, oh, you're so Christian. You make a cake. Yeah. Okay, you're not crying. Make a cake is cool. Yeah. <laughs> well, it also gives you this weird insight into what they think bothers us about them, right? Yeah. Oh, you Christians, you're always so good to everyone and kind. Fuck you. <laughs> oh, it's so bad. And also, okay, I think they've all had. A lot of plastic surgery. All I'm going to talk about in this whole scene is how is like superficial shit about how people look. Because they thank okay. you, <laughs> Kara, for beginning it. Because every woman <laughs> in this movie is beautiful except for one crazy flaw. Right? Main character, lovely except for the lip filler. African American lady, lovely except one of her eyes is facing in a different cardinal fucking direction than the other one. Chloe that can be lovely. Chloe looks like she was attempting a fucking. Uh, who's that one that's who's in all Chloe? the Christopher Guest There's movies? There's no Chloe. What's her name? Chloe. Oh, Chloe. 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 Chloe looks like she's trying to be that woman that's in the Christopher Guest oh, movies. Stifler's but, mom. Yeah, Stifler's mom, but mm-hmm. unironically. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and Glenn looks like she's going to lose the mayorship to Bill de Blasio. It's really, it's a whole thing. <laughs> what I'm seeing is a lot of perfectly lovely women who had perfectly unnecessary plastic surgery. Yes. And I'm yes. like, is this just an old lady Christian thing? Like, I don't get it. And then in the scene, part of the reason I'm bringing up only superficial shit in the scene is because... They're all mean to each other superficially. There's the weirdest stuff happening in the scene. Number one, 
Coley tells Glenn, you look like you're off to a United Nations summit. What the fuck what does that, that mean? To mean? Well, it's because she dared to wear a suit. Yeah, like, is that an insult? She looks amazing, first Oh, of my all. God, was that a you're in pants? Did yeah, that was a <laughs> yes. you're wearing pants joke. Also, what temperature is it in this house? <laughs> Unclear. Coley is dressed like a Victorian vampire. Mm-hmm. Yep. And mm-hmm. Gracie is wearing a sundress. Yep. yep. It's the weird. Coley is literally wearing like a velvet coat with large, <laughs> like a large bow at the neck. And Gracie's wearing like a flowing floral sundress. And I'm very confused as to how they all look comfortable. Right. <laughs> right. It's clearly different temperatures on different sides of the room by a lot. And then, OK, so while they're bitching at each other and all of that shit. Patrice takes Glenn aside and she says, hey, look, we've done a really sloppy job of introducing this to the film. Do you want to just spell out the fact that you're flirting with a guy you, that you're not married to on mm-hmm, your on your text mm-hmm. messages? Do you want to just like make that clear to the audience? And she's like, yeah, OK. All right. Yeah. I also love that Glenn justifies her her affair as she deserves a treat. Yes. Right. <laughs> look, I have a plastic container of vegan cookie dough bites that I grab one of every four seconds as a little treat for Eli. <laughs> That's how she's treating her in a fair. Like, oh, you, you know what? I've been good today. I did my morning workout. I'm going to have a little affair. That's for me. I have a nice little cheat on my husband. She also has this weird lab. Like she goes through this, like I do everything for everyone else. I deserve having an affair. And like, fuck whoever you want to. And then she's like also my husband's cheating on me so i mean fuck like you know okay yeah they they kind of like bury the lead that her husband is literally a garbage person and we see this later he's fucking awful everyone in her life absolutely sucks yeah like i feel so bad for this girl by the end of the movie well and it's yet another christian movie accidentally underscoring how dangerous and terrible it is to be judgy at people for being divorced Right. Mm -hmm. Because she doesn't want to have an affair. She wants to divorce that piece of shit she's married to is what she wants. Yeah. He's so garbage. He's so mean, as is her mom. But whatever. I digress. I'm getting ahead. We'll get there. But this scene, (laughs) the reason that this scene exists is for Glenn to bitch and moan about her hard life, which, to be fair, they do show how terrible everyone in her life is. Yet... Her life is hard because she's really rich and Mm -hmm. everyone is mean to her for being rich. Yep. Like, she doesn't have... It's like she's literally complaining to the black woman in the movie. Yes. About how her kid got into West Point but won't go. (laughs) Yes. And I wrote in all caps, Hello, I am a tone. Can you hear me? (laughs) (laughs) By the way, when she says that, this is when Patrice says, now that I think about it, you probably have it harder than a black woman. And I wrote in my notes, okay, movie, relax. <laughs> relax. Yes. All right. So now it's time for, for dinner. We're going to start with Grace. And I just, because this, this is a weird one for me. It's one of those things that like after the pandemic, it, we, you wonder why the hell we ever had the idea of, hey, let's all join hands right before we eat with them. Yeah. yeah, as a tradition. Well, some parts of the country are doing it extra now. They're like, yeah. everyone lick your hands. Yep. <laughs> We're overloading these Texas hospitals, damn it. <laughs> we will make sure Eli doesn't care about the fourth wave. <laughs> Thanks, man. I'm I'm right in the middle of that shit. <laughs> so yeah, so Sarah says Grace in the style of a fucking ASMR video, by the way. <laughs> I know, it's kinda hot. I, I have really to talk was. about the food. <laughs> I have to talk about the food. Oh, it's God. the grossest it's looking so food. Gross. It is. It's like it's like summer camp spaghetti. Like yeah. do yep. better than this. Because look, here's the thing: you can get a film crew together and rent a mansion and a couple of prom dresses to make your characters rich, but you can't rent fancy looking food. You gotta <laughs> buy that shit. Which is why they're having fucking lasagna noodles and cheese sauce. It is <laughs> horrifying. Well, and the sad thing is, you know that's just crew dinner. Well, right, yep. exactly. You know that's exactly. Just what they feed just everybody. Move craft services over to the table for a few <laughs> yeah. minutes. Yes. This movie did not have a behind the scenes DVD, but I promise you if it did, they'd be like, and you might not know this, but in the fancy dinner scene, we all actually got to eat that spaghetti. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Jesus. Well, and what's so funny about the movie is as you're thinking to yourself, like, 
is that just a fucking plate of spaghetti somebody made on their counter or something? Yeah. <laughs> All the characters are like, hey, let's wait to eat and open our gifts first. So they're thinking the same shit. Oh, yeah. And it's spaghetti. And it's not in like a warming dish. Who does no, that? No, right? It's going to be freezing cold. <laughs> <laughs> and you, if you look up close, you can see that they, they use the shaky Parmesan cheese that's like shelf stable. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? The stuff you can just keep at room temperature. Yeah, the stuff you can keep next to your survival buckets for sure. <laughs> yeah, for sure, for sure. <laughs> now, about these gifts, Kara, this is what I picture you and your friends do. You <laughs> get is. together once a year. And give each other Bibles and pictures of ourselves. Perfume. Give each other very emotional. Magazine uh, subscriptions. Magazine <laughs> oh, yeah. Subscriptions. Coley's like, we have to fill it out ourselves. What the fuck? Yeah. <laughs> like, it's so funny. Because she's the fucking hero goth of the <laughs> <she's> <laughs> So mean. Like, I love her. She, I feel like the actress herself is that mean and she was like the script doesn't go far enough i'm just gonna make some creative edits because <laughs> it's yeah so good so many things happen in the scene that make me just lose it okay first of all one of them gives everybody a picture of them together in college oh my god but they okay didn't, they didn't want to take a photo for the film so they photoshop but and by photoshop what i mean is they said each of you bring a picture of yourselves i don't care what orientation your body is or, or the I'm, lighting or <laughs> yeah or lighting i'm going to cut it out with like kitty scissors yep. and then, yep. and then with use zigzag paste, scissors literal paste to paste it over a backdrop of a sunny city oh charleston i think yeah well and, and so here's the fucked up thing right this is not a picture of them when they were in college this is a picture of them from the previous year's reunion they could not get these five women to stand in front of a site of any kind to take a fucking no. picture? How no. is this easier? <laughs> I, they had still shots from this movie that they could right? have used. Yes. <laughs> it's fucking, but it, this is the worst digital imagery I've ever seen. And I've seen Mike Lindell's evidence that the election was fraud. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> Coley said in the middle of the gift giving, Coley's like, I need more alcohol. I'm like, you go, girl. <laughs> and she Fuck literally yeah. holds up a bottle of wine. She goes, who's drinking with me? This bottle of wine was $500. And I'm like, then why are you serving fucking spaghetti? Yeah. <laughs> I'm so confused. So all the money went to the wine. <laughs> it's also super not. Like, they, they did their best to hide the fucking Boone's Hill Strawberry Farm <laughs> label. <laughs> but it's one of those jumbo bottles they get at like the value section of the alcohol store. Yeah, this box of wine costs $500. <laughs> and of course, because Gracie has been on screen for more than two minutes, she has to have a weepy, ugly cry about how important Jesus is to her. She Essentially, she gives us the same came to Jesus speech that she just gave on the beach five fucking scenes ago. I know. It's so unnecessary. It feels like she was workshopping it on Sarah. And <laughs> yeah, <somewhere. laughs> I think I think that is what they were doing, Eli. Yeah. I think that's like not just to be funny. I think that's like, oh, it's so hard to come out to your friends as Christians. So yeah. She practiced on the Christian. Yep. Oh, my God. God, so you're right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. God, damn it. God, their problems are so minor. I don't even notice them. I don't even <laughs> recognize them. <laughs> All right, so we we cut to after dinner. Coley is they're they're trying to do Coley is like way too drunk, but she seems so pleasantly inebriated. She seems like she's having a blast. She doesn't have to drive anywhere tonight. She's also for real. Like if you remember her at dinner, she was like, "You're a fat cunt. I need to drink." <laughs> like she's awful. And then after dinner, she's like dancing, and she's like, "I love you all so yeah, much." You're right. like, yeah, you're right. I really like her drunk. Right. She's so much nicer. And they're like, "Whoa, put her in the scrubber with the." Hose pipe on her. Like, <laughs> I'm just saying, this is very unreal. I, as someone who has ridden in an Uber with Heath and Andrew after a wine tasting, they have a lot to learn about what someone who's actually wasted acts like. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah, so everybody goes to bed. There's a thunderstorm outside. So, we see an awful lot of stock lightning footage that they had. Yep. They they, yep. they bought the whole fucking thing. They're going to use the whole fucking thing, right? 
it felt like there was a storm during filming and they weren't going to waste it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not like this storm matters. You know? Yeah. Well, it kind of matters. Well, it, because <laughs> it's it, like actually a really important plot point. <laughs> it depends on how much you care about Grace. <laughs> well, but like, it's not like you need an excuse for a person to have a car accident, right? It's right. not like you have to explain that away. <laughs> so, okay, so we cut to the next morning and we get to see where Coley wakes up hungover. Because that's what she deserves, damn it. And uh, Patrice confronts her about her alcoholism. She's like, did you go to AA? And she's like, yeah, it didn't really work for me. And she's like, actually, they don't report their numbers. So we have no idea how well it works for anybody. And she's like, shush, 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 shush. <laughs> I, she says, oh, yeah, I've even tried AA. I was so hoping for a battery joke here. You know, she, no, but it takes a D cell to get me up. And, <laughs> no, it was alcohol. <laughs> anonymous yeah, yeah. so and, and also like apparently part of the tradition and i think this explains a lot of why everybody keeps coming back part of the tradition of this reunion is that coley just gives everybody a fat fucking check at the end of it right like a thanks for pretending to like me check yeah it is weird but we don't ever get to see how much it is right <laughs> i really want to know what this movie thinks is friendship maintaining money right <laughs> Because it's either eight million dollars or sixty five dollars in Cinnabon coupons. <laughs> also, they don't let us know until Patrice is back downstairs meeting up with the other girls that everybody got a check. Right, like they're trying to be wink, wink, nod, nod. You're my favorite because they only show Coley giving the check to Patrice. And there's something just really uncomfortable about the scene where she's like, "Here's some money," and Patrice is like, "You shouldn't have." And she's like, "Just take the fucking money." And she's like, "You know I will." <laughs> and I'm like, Why? Yeah. I'm like. I don't know any friend groups like this where like one of the girls is rich and she just writes her friends checks. So, yeah. So Patrice goes downstairs. Uh, Gracie and Sarah are about to leave. To, they all have to be like, you know, Sarah has to be like, well, yeah, she gave me a big check, too, but I'm going to give it to my church because Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Right. Yeah. And they're like, <laughs> but you're ki like you have kids and you're like a struggling single mom with no job. Apparently not. Nobody has ever referenced what you do for a nope. living. Like nope. you'd have no earning potential. And she's like, it's it's okay. God will provide. Yeah. You're like, what? Why? I'm so sick. He of just this sent tone. you a magic check through a friend. No, no, I'm going to give him. He'll provide it. It's like the old joke about God sending a helicopter. Yes, right. yes. Yeah. He's like, didn't you see that helicopter? Yeah, you're so <laughs> right. Oh, so, my God. <laughs> And then, you know, because, of course, once they paid for the subscription, they were allowed to use as much of that storm footage as they wanted. So we, <laughs> we see a little bit more of that. Sarah's back home folding laundry, being domestic, when the news cuts in to talk about a fatal car accident. It was Gracie, the very Christian girl. Well, mm -hmm. and what's so amazing about this announcement is it's like, Grace so-and-so has died. And then you see the movie realize that we have no idea who these fucking assholes' names are. So it quickly flashes to everyone finding out. And it's like, it's the blonde one. The I'm blonde so one. The, blonde. <laughs> <laughs> the, thin, the thin one that we made fun of for being fat. She's the dead one. And, it's, and also, it's such a stupid way to introduce this. She could get a call or something. They don't come on the news and just go like, there was a fatal accident. The person who died was like, come on. That's literally never happened in the no. history of news. Like, <laughs> Exactly. Thing. Let me throw this out there. Uh huh. They should, right? Build a little suspense into it. Oh, looks like there was a fire in downtown Los Angeles. And the people who died are yeah, right. Jason, right? Get right. a little fun out Drum of it. Drum roll. Absolutely. Pause not. after the between the first and last names, you know? You could do it when they do the lotto numbers. <laughs> they only do this when there are horrific tragedies, and usually it takes days before yeah. they're cleared to identify the people. Right, name. of course. Or when there's some sort of like big like murder, suicide or something. When somebody dies tragically and it is tragic in a traffic crash. Yeah. They don't get any airtime. No. None. And the, when they cut, the weird thing is when they do identify a victim on television, they say their name and they show a photo of them but they didn't do that no. and if they had done that we would have known who grace was immediately but they didn't have the capability to make fake newsreel footage so yep. they just no. used another newsreel footage <laughs> of right, another they car did. crash they totally yep. did <laughs> a different person's actual death they were and like they, they won't mind it. yeah it was, yeah, for a Christian movie. it was like in canada too it's like the wrong kind of like cop cars well, right, yeah, no, they were driving on the other side of the road or something <laughs> like yeah. very strange watching a swedish cop get out and like use their special prongs that only swedish cops get <laughs> it was, it was a weird so, scene. It was, no it's a good <laughs> topic 
So, yeah, the news guy might as well say, you know, and here's hoping she was right with Jesus. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Now we cut over to Coley sadly putting on makeup. She's gotten the news as well. And this is, I do believe, the first time in all of God Awful movies that we've ever had to watch a character flashback to their own flashback. <laughs> right? Yeah, she okay. flashes back during this big long flashback and includes the flashback to when she was a kid. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted the kid to have a flashback to her coming in second place in the beauty contest. <laughs> and then she goes to the car to go to the funeral and legit her driver's like, you look like shit lady. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's, like, it's the most judgy. It's like more judgy than any of the women in this movie have been so far. Yeah, they're very judgy of her having a drink or two when her friend died. I, I wrote in my notes, Noah, when my heart explodes, you officially have my permission to have a cigarette. Yeah, that's nice. I'm going to shock you here, Eli, but thinking about fatal heart disease does not instill a craving for <laughs> cigarettes in me. But I appreciate well, it. The will permission. at the time. Okay. It will at the time. But he also isn't being judgy about the fact that she's drunk. He's like, nope. you look bad. Right, right. Do he you says, want do you to want to go, go the by the salon? salon? Yeah, exactly, exactly. He's like, you're not <laughs> you're not going to the funeral in that. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense because she's basically, she looks fabulous. Her hair is done perfectly and she's wearing one-tenth less makeup than she is in the rest of the movie where she looks like a clown. Right. I'm like, yeah. she looks lovely. Why is everybody being so mean? Well, and then we have to go, speaking of being mean, we have to go meet Glenn's terrible family. She's getting ready for the funeral in a fucking hat that looks like a rejected Tim Burton prop. <laughs> <laughs> and this is where we finally meet her terrible husband who doesn't want to go to a funeral. Call. Yeah, he's she's like, like will you come with me and he goes whatever it's your friend <laughs> <laughs> he's such a piece of shit when you die I'll go <laughs> he's also reading the newspaper because this is what, how the director yes. thinks that people show that they're like inhuman is they, they keep their eyes down on whatever they're reading while they interact because both the shitty shit husband and the shitty shit mom do the same thing oh you're right they do <laughs> they do yeah. and, and the, the shitty shit mom we meet immediately after right she walks out from the shitty husband shitty mom is sitting there reading the newspaper on the porch and she's like hope you didn't cheap on the fucking funeral flowers hope you weren't cheap <laughs> about it oh she's also like i hope you sent funeral flowers from all of us yeah even uh -huh. though none of us give a shit enough to actually go to the funeral <laughs> right yeah because she's like well mom would you like to come to the funeral with me and she's like why the fuck would i want to go to a funeral funeral suck funeral suck she literally says I think the words that she said, like in the script, it's like, why would you ask me that question? Yeah. <laughs> so it was something weird like, that's a fucking stupid question. What's, right. <laughs> what's so funny about the mom character is she's a miserable bitch, but she's supposed to be like the high class evil mom, right? We're too rich to have any humanity, except she's just like some Florida lady who's using her walker as a chair. Yeah. So the whole, right. she's like, I have no time for the peasants. Excuse me. My TV guide has just been thrown wet onto the porch. <laughs> I must read it. <laughs> That's true. They never pan out to show how big the house actually right. is. Yeah. <laughs> they just show only bricks right around. <laughs> yeah, good yep. point. I don't get that because it's like, I guess they're all supposed to be rich. I don't know, because they show Coley's house and it's stunning. Yeah. It's huge and stunning. But then they don't quite show Glenn's supposed to be the really rich lady, right? Like with that comes from all this money, and they're like, oh, we could only afford one rich people. We could only exactly. get one porn <laughs> mansion to shoot in. Yeah. I'm honestly surprised that we didn't just see that same house from the front. You know? I know. It's right, like yeah. a different angle. So. No, they like they flipped the image so yeah. that we wouldn't. <laughs> exactly. <know. laughs> Now the tree's on the left. Oh, yeah, no, no, the porch on the other one was on the right side of the house. Yeah. <laughs> They've put a giant mustache on the house. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> and a so, monocle. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay, so they show up at the funeral. Coley is drunk and not at all up for this shit. And I'm thinking to myself, yeah, man, it's a funeral. You can just not be judgy about that kind of shit, right? Like, yep. her friend yeah, died. Yeah, she doesn't even seem that drunk. She just mostly looks sad. Right. 
And everybody's like, oh, God, you look like shit. And it's like, why is everybody so mean to her? She looks perfectly nice. Right. Glenn sees her. She's like, oh, your hair is terrible. Let me put this ridiculous hat on you instead. (laughs) Now you bear the curse of the hat that cannot be undone. It's like the fucking movie from The Ring, that hat. (laughs) So, yeah, so we go inside the church for the funeral. Everybody's really sad because religion doesn't work. This is where we meet Gracie's mom, who is apparently like the group mom. Everybody loved Gracie's mom, right? Yeah. She says, can we all still keep calling you mama? And I was like, or what? You have like a a title removing in some kind of ceremony (laughs) where you all tear a piece of her garment one by one? (laughs) I also have to point out that there is a baby in this scene Mm -hmm. and the baby obviously does not know what acting is and everyone's crying and the baby is like, what are you all doing? You're all freaking out. You guys are all freaking out. What's going on? They hand her to what her quote unquote mom and she's like, I do not know this fucking woman. And she looks directly off camera and she's like, mom, mom, why did you have this stranger? Well, and there's this, okay, so we have, and what we're seeing is Sarah walking through the funeral just killing it at funeraling because she's so Christian. Right. And then like one of the ways in which she kills it is she takes care of the baby during the funeral. So the grieving mother won't have to. Right. But the baby so obviously does not want to be with this lady. They can barely (laughs) get the three seconds of film required to tell us that. Very much so. Yes. Oh, oh. And this I love this so much. This is where we get to see what this writer thinks that an award winning poet's poem would sound like. Right. (laughs) Holy shit. It's so bad. Roses are red. Gracie is blue. (laughs) (laughs) She's dead now. And so are you. No, you're not dead. Hmm. The people who wrote this poem (laughs) got in a fight over whether or not it could rhyme. And so it doesn't, but it almost. (laughs) Yeah, it's like they wrote a poem that rhymes and then they go, wait, wait. I think atheist lefties don't rhyme. <laughs> so we should <laughs> probably change a few words. Wait, wait. If their poems don't rhyme, how do they crochet them onto a pillow and then put that prominently whenever they have guests? That doesn't make any fucking How's sense. How's even a poem if it doesn't rhyme? <laughs> yes. How do people know what to do if they sprinkle when they tinkle? Think. <laughs> <laughs> and then my favorite part is after the poem, there's this like sort of hot dude. That gets up and plays a sort of good song. That dude, like his voice was so much more soulful than anyone expected. Like, cause he's got that sort of goofy, like guitar guy at the party look. And then he starts singing. And like, I mean, the song, I didn't care for the song much, but the goddamn, but his voice was incredible. No, like he was actually really talented. And my hope is that like, I don't know why he's in this movie. So my hope is that he's like not a Christian asshole, but really his shtick is like that South Park episode where Cartman realizes that he can make way Uh more money. Oh, (laughs) contraire, Kara Sanders. To Maria. Oh, oh no. God damn it. Oh, you For, did your research, didn't if you? If you paid close attention to the opening credits of this movie, there were special thanks yes. to this guy for yep. letting him use his song. Oh, he is fuck. a Christian music artist, and the last thing on his Instagram is him being like, I won't wear fucking masks. You can't <laughs> stop. <laughs> no! <laughs> Every moment you said said. you know, Kara loves him. And (laughs) I'm going to tag you both in a tweet right now. (laughs) (laughs) Michael, I'm going to block your ass. I'm going to block. Anchor, you can't block me. I have so many profiles, Kara said. All you right. Can only All block right. the first. The 10. only thing I can do is move on. Uh, I'll try to. <laughs> I'll try to distract them, Kara. So, the funeral's over. Sarah has to give back the baby. So now all the named characters are going to go to Grace's mom's house where no one else will have gone. (laughs) They have this insane moment where they have to justify the fact that the family won't be there. So they're like, we'll see you back at the house. We're going to go to the gravesite, but you guys go to the house. We'll be Mm -hmm. at the gravesite while you're at the house. (laughs) (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And clearly these actors were told to vamp about the funeral. For a few minutes, Mm -hmm. like wait as they wait for this scene to go. So and it goes so wrong so quickly. So Patrice is going to spend pretty much the rest of the movie talking about how great that 
anti-masker song was. <laughs> but the only thing she has to say about it was it was lovely. So she just keeps saying that over and over again. And Sarah just keeps desperately trying to think of anything else to say about that last scene. What are generic funeral words? <laughs> I'm still sad our friend is dead. <laughs> right. Now. But all I remember about this scene is Coley being like, you all fucking suck. I'm so <laughs> drunk. You wish it was me, you fucking cunts. And then she just goes <laughs> around the circle pushing all their buttons, basically saying all the things that are wrong with them. And it's so uncomfortable because at one point she gets to Patrice and she's like, you weren't even born in hot Atlanta. I'm blacker than you. Bitch. Yes. <laughs> she totally and everybody's like, Ooh. I stood up from my chair and I was like, Coley. I was, I was chanting for her. Cause she, she slow plays it. She's like, and you, the whole black thing. Real quote. <laughs> All right. Real literal quote. I grew up closer to the hood than any of y'all. Yep. And my friends. The next time you think you have self-control, imagine being that African-American actress and standing there for what was probably more than one take and then not killing everyone associated with this movie. Oh, oh my God. Wow. And she's like, y'all wish I was the one that died. And they're like, well, right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're all like, Coley, Coley, chill out. Coley, Coley, you're making a scene. Nobody is there, by the way. It's just them yep, in the yep. room. But like, Coley, yep. you're making a scene. And finally, she's like, deep inside, you know, there is no God. And I was like, go. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, we should point out that up. Coley's whole fucking diatribe started when Sarah was saying some Jesus words again. She's like, God, fuck, can you please shut up about your religion for eight? fucking seconds. <laughs> yes. That was the blow up. I have never felt closer to any character in any <laughs> Christian movie. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Which is why it, it hurts so bad when what comes comes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> also, when she has her big outburst about you all know in your heart God is dead, mom, dead girl's mom is there and she turns around like... Uh, and then everyone leaves and leaves grieving <laughs> mom there. She's just like, oh, you're all leaving after you loudly screamed that my daughter is gone into the oblivion from whence we never return. Cool. Cool, 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 cool. Well, no, Sarah sticks around. We'll we'll come back to that. <laughs> but first we have to go to a restaurant where Patrice and Glenn are sitting around going like, okay, so we're just, we're fucking done with Coley and her bullshit, right? Is that, we're done. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Their opening line in this scene is, do you think we stayed long enough? And I wrote <laughs> yeah. my notes. I mean, after you scream, she's dead in front of the mother, you can go. It's not yeah, really it's a timing <laughs> thing at that point. So, okay. So late that night, Sarah's still hanging out with Gracie's mom because she's the good Christian one. When Gracie's daughters show up and Sarah Bibles at them until everybody feels okay about their mom dying. Mm -hmm, yep. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, now, Carrie, you you counsel people through. This is pretty much what you do, right? You just pull out the Bible and read at them until that they tell you to shut up and leave, right? In a quiet voice, though. Yeah, my favorite part of what they did, which is not what you're supposed to do, is Patrice is getting all existential, and she's talking about like these deep kind of concerns about what she's done with her life. Right? This is what happens when you lose somebody. Very often, as you start reflecting on your own life, and you start going like, "Am I living the way I want to live? Am I living life to the fullest?" And she she starts to get a little bit emotional. And immediately, the main character of the movie, who's supposed to be the good person, Sarah, goes, "Don't cry." <laughs> <laughs> Don't cry. Bottle it up. Bottle it Which up. Which is exactly the opposite <laughs> of what you do when somebody is grieving. You never tell somebody don't cry. I agree to disagree. <laughs> disagree. Okay. 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 I hate to disagree with you on air. I know that this is somewhat <laughs> area of expertise, but I've been pushing down the death of my father for seven years now and it's going awesome. So I'm sure it is. Yeah, I'm not going to air all of the text messages that you and I share <laughs> about our mental health <laughs> issues, Eli. <laughs> Eating a cookie dough bite because I deserve a special treat <laughs> a third of the way through our podcast record. Yeah. So, okay. And by the way, so now... We are done with Dead Lady. That whole character is is over with. Yeah, she doesn't exist anymore. Nope. She, yeah. well, she's yep. And so, <laughs> I 
not like in the movie. I mean, not like yeah. in the world. <laughs> in all senses, though, she she doesn't yeah. exist. True, anymore. but they never like they never reference her nope. again. We will never <laughs> go back to that. And so, okay, then Sarah goes to see Flirted Pastor. She's made him, she's baked him a cake for as a thank you for watching his kids. But it is the most comically oversized and inappropriate cake that you could possibly bake for someone in that it's instance. It's a sheet cake. It's a, it's a gigantic a Costco 35 sheet person <laughs> sheet cake that doesn't have anything written on it. That's the problem is they went to Costco and they were like, we need a cake for the scene. And they were like, we have these sheet cakes for, you know, funerals. And they were like, Oh, um, <laughs> could you at least write something on it? And they were like, that'll be any amount of money. And they were like, fuck no. It doesn't really matter. <laughs> we spent our budget on the porn mansion. <laughs> so the pastor asks her out on a date. Again, in any other movie, this is just this is your creepy boss asking you out. But this movie doesn't know that. So, you know, she has to just, oh, my God, she's just so flustered and so nervous. But she says, yes, right. She overplays the flustered and nervous by 13 fucking miles, by the way. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he sounds like an unsubtle vampire, right? He's like, how about we get a bite? <laughs> an official bite. And she's like, a bite? And he's like, a bite. Honestly, if he had grown fangs at the end of the scene, I would have been like, okay. <laughs> oh, a bite. <laughs> also, right after she agrees to go on a date with him. He's like, you can call me Rodney. We're going on a date. And she's like, I really need to still call you pastor. And he's like, oh, it's a kink <laughs> thing. Okay, yeah. I mean, yeah, right, that's so what, sure, sure. Is that what gets me in the door. Sure. Yeah. And also important side note, this is going to be a weird ass plot point later. As she leaves, the pastor's secretary gives her a shitty look. Right. Mm, oh, oh, foreshadowing. Yeah, that's very important because they're going to add two and a half seconds to the movie <laughs> yes. later on about that look. Yep. All right. Well, this movie has officially moved on to a plot about Sarah and Pastor Rod hooking up. So I need a minute to readjust. But first, let me give Act 3 the hard sell. Isn't this a movie about the dead friend? Are we really done with that entire plot line? Why the hell would we kill her off then? Find out the answers to different questions because we're literally never going to mention Dead Friend again when we return for the mostly unrelated conclusion of Only God Can. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He did. Okay, okay. Well, as I've made it clear in a bunch of places, I do not know him that well. So, yeah. Well, I appreciate you checking in. Hey, Kara. Eli, Jesus, wh why were you in my bathroom? Oh, I'm not allowed to use the one at our house before noon because I ruin it for the rest of the day. Right. Horrifying. So listen, have you been using my name to try to audition for John Wick 4? Yes. Yes, I have. But enough about that. Did you get that picture of a pug I sent you? W which one? <laughs> Any of them. You didn't text me back. Oh, yeah. My service is um bad. Oh. Well, then you should consider switching over to Mint Mobile. Noah, what are you doing here? Also, once Mint Mobile. I was making sure Eli used the actual bathroom instead of your walk-in closet. Appreciate that. I mean, who has a closet that big? First time was on you, Kara. First time and, was on you. And Mint Mobile offers premium wireless service starting at just 15 bucks a month. 15 bucks a month? What's the catch? There isn't one. Mint Mobile's secret sauce is that they're the first company to sell wireless service online only. By cutting out retail stores, there's no crazy overhead costs that get passed down to you in the form of mystery fees. Instead, Mint just passes on sweet savings direct to you. Yeah, when Mint became a sponsor, I switched my whole family over, and we're never going back. The service is great, and it's a fraction of what I was paying before. But do I get to keep my phone? Yep. Use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and keep your same phone number along with all your existing contacts. And if you're not 100% satisfied, Mint Mobile has you covered with their seven-day money-back guarantee. All right, guys, I'm sold. So where do I sign up? To get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash gam. That's mintmobile.com slash gam. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash gam. Awesome. Thanks. All right. Well, then I guess it's time to catch you up on some pug picks. So this is Little Pickles, and she is so sassy. <sighs> She's borking at the neighbors. Don't care. Classic. Patrice, it's, it's so wonderful to see you. Well, of course. How could I not come? I mean, the children's hospital. Yes, it is such important work. Well, I've been meaning to ask you. You didn't invite... What's up? 
up, huh? Uh, you guys remember that from the commercial? No? You're all too young. Well, you'll get it when you're... Actually, never mind. Never mind. You won't Hello, Cody. Um, it's good to see you. I, I didn't know you were invited. I wasn't. I was actually in the hospital anyway. Saw you on my way out, so... Well, Coley, why were you in the hospital? Tried to fuck a fire hydrant again. Oh, oh Coley. What can I say? I like him sick. Uh, Coley, why don't we just... Wait, 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 wait. Tell me that in one second. I got something to say. Everyone, everyone, please. Ching, 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 ching. Ching, ching, ching. What? I just want you all to know, if your kid dies... Coley, God. I said if. Grow up. Get a Costco membership. Anyway, if... Your kid dies. There is no God, and they're going to return to the void from whence they came. Coley, Coley. Also, also, can anyone give me a ride home? My car has a breathalyzer, and no, queefing on it doesn't work. It's Christmas, Coley. And we're back for still more of this shit. We're going to rejoin the action with Pastor Rod picking Sarah up for that big date at fucking 2 p.m. or so, based on where the sun is at the moment. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, I forgot. This movie has like a whole other fucking subplot that's right. so unnecessary. Uh, that turns on into the entire goddamn plot before it's over. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, like they were doing a group project to write a movie. <laughs> One person... <laughs> Wrote a romantic comedy yes. about the time she gave her pastor a hose. <laughs> One person wrote the beginning of a movie about how none of her college friends speak to her anymore. And one of them died halfway through the project. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he pulls up to pick her up and she runs out to meet him and brings her two sons with her. Although we only see one of them weirdly. Right. She's like, I couldn't find a babysitter. Yeah. She surprises him that the kids are coming on the date as though she thought they were just going to fucking go to Buffalo Wild Wings and sit at a table for two while her kids are like, this land is going to the city. This <laughs> land. <laughs> and I also, I don't get if this was like, a, it was like a, a means to surprise us as the audience or if it was actually meant to surprise the pastor. But she's sitting there and they're talking to each other as if it's just the two of them. And then her kid pops out of the back seat right. and goes, I want a hand. <laughs> and you're like jesus christ where did he come from right like, he popped into the scene like a fucking muppet on sesame street like wow yeah. you're just behind that the whole time but clearly this man came to her house to pick her up so he watched he witnessed her walk out of her house right where the kids are hiding children. behind the trash cans until he pulled up and why <laughs> wouldn't he notice his own back doors opening <laughs> no i get it me and my wife travel with heath this happens on a pretty regular <laughs> Can that be Heath's catchphrase? I want a hamburger. <laughs> yes. I don't know where he is right now or what he's doing, but he just shouted yes involuntarily. Yes, uh -huh. <laughs> All right. So, but then now apparently the reason that this scene exists is so that we can see what a good dad he would be, right? So, because he's like, yeah, sure, I'll take you and your sons out on a date. If you read this as him being a pedophile, by the way, this scene is like even creepier than the other <laughs> scenes. By the way, is there any other way to read right, him? Right. Yeah. Come on. Not with that haircut. So, <laughs> <laughs> so he takes him over to his place where he can grill some burgers and he dads at him a whole bunch. Oh, and she is fucking soaked when he teaches her kids how to meet. I mean, she... <laughs> Oh, she needs a, a whole sundress change. Yep, yep. <laughs> Eli, you should write. So. <laughs> you should write romance. <laughs> I've always said that. I've always said that. Oh, you have not seen his Muppet Babies fan fiction yet. Let me tell yep, you, he exactly. already does. So, so meanwhile, Patrice is at her office poet banking. <laughs> <They have> <laughs> They have no idea what she does for a living. So some guys in there just yelling generic business words. I was so yep. confused by this because I didn't hear. Her. I must not have been listening that closely when she referenced being a banker. I thought she was only a poet. And I was like, how does she have such a nice office? Yeah, right. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's, it's she works for a big poetry firm in Manhattan. <laughs> <laughs> big poetry. 
She turns <laughs> desk next to her as J. Jonah Jameson. I need more rhymes for love, damn it. <laughs> 50 rhymes for love on my desk by Monday morning. <laughs> So, but the point of this, you know, is that uh, Patrice gets a call from Glenn, Glenn's internet boyfriend, who she's been emotionally cheating on her husband with, is coming to Charleston, and she's having like the "give me permission to fuck this dude" conversation with Patrice, right? And Patrice is awful to her. Oh, isn't she though? This is like not how friends are with each other, like. None of these people are supportive of each other. My friends would never be this shitty. They would only care about what makes me happy. They would be like, it sounds to me like you're having a moral issue with this. What are the benefits? What are the negatives? Let me help you work through this. Sure. But to be clear, Glenn has never once said she has a moral issue with any of this. She's like, I'm doing this shit. And all right, her friends yeah. are like, I deserve okay, if this. you want to be a big fucking whore. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like, sure. oh. Well, and what's great is in order for it not to cause a scandal, she needs... Patrice to bring him as her date to this fundraiser thing. Mm -hmm. And Patrice's answer to that is, <laughs> yes, I would love to, but I can't be seen with a white guy. I'm yes! a black woman. <laughs> I'm a black woman interested in social justice. I can't have a white guy hanging off my arm. Literal fucking line in this dumbass yeah. movie. It would ruin my cred. Also, I just realized just now that this whole event at the, they just, what, did they run out of money in the budget? Because they never reference it again. No. Nope. And it doesn't happen in the movie. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they talk about that. You're right. They talk about this the entire movie. They talk about the big fundraiser for the women's shelter. And we just end before that happens. Yep. Yeah. We never see the women's no. shelter. <laughs> nope. And when Patrice says no and gets judgy, Glenn tells her, real quote, the Bible is just a book about white people trying to feel good about themselves, end quote. Okay, first of all, not white people. There's no white people. startling <laughs> revelation about the person who made this movie. <laughs> right, not since fucking whatever her name Fox News lady said that Santa was white. Have they shown their cards quite so clearly? Megan Fox. No. Uh, <laughs> what was her name? Uh, it's Megan Kelly, but I like that she just got short. It's like uh, it's like Tim Apple there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. You know, that one. So, yeah. The one who they got rid of when the president got mad at her. Yeah, exactly. that's the one. <laughs> With the blood coming out of her whatever. Yeah. <sighs> but Patrice is like, no, no, I've been reading the Bible. It turns out it's all about social justice. <laughs> Is it? Oh, she, but not, but not because, because <laughs> that's not social justice. Like she goes on to describe colorblindness, which right. is the opposite of social justice. Yep. She literally says, it's not about color and race. It's about forgiveness. God is the great equalizer, which is white supremacist nonsense. Yes. That is white supremacist rhetoric. Yeah, she says, God doesn't see race. And I wrote in my notes, I mean, unless someone gets bonked on the head, then all of a sudden the timer starts depending on your race. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Oh, my God. Also, Patrice legit compares herself to God. She does. She does. She's like, God wrote a book about white people and I write poems. And ultimately, we're grappling with the same issues. Yep, me and God <laughs> pretty much dealing with the same shit. So, okay. So that night, Sarah and Rod are discussing the big grilling out date. There's so many of the scenes in this movie that start off with people discussing the last scene they were in. So many times. <laughs> but this leads to Sarah asking him why he became a pastor. Now, the reason he became a pastor was because, yeah, you know, so we hear <laughs> that story like they, they drag that out over six minutes. Yeah, there's an actual story. <laughs> why would you put this in your movie? <laughs> Uh, you can write anything. You can write anything. <laughs> you can have aliens in it if you wanted them. No, I literally wrote, you know, the hot priest plot line in Fleabag. This is not that. <laughs> this is not that. <laughs> it's not no, it's not. <laughs> he ain't like, no Andrew Scott, baby. He ain't no Andrew Scott. Can you literally, can you imagine dating someone like that? Just stop and think about what it would be like 
to be a fly on the wall in their house if they like were married oh. and just existed. Like I would just constantly be vomiting and stabbing myself in the eyes. The yeah. sex would be so boring. So boring. Imagine, creepy. imagine thinking that you have a good idea for what your job could be. Cause it's based on feeling guilty about something when you were eight. Well, right. Okay. So <laughs> let's, let's actually dig into his boring ass story for just a second here. He had a life-changing moment at eight years old. Because, you know, when you're making your best decisions, really is eight. Yeah, that's why that's the age that Mormons say you should get baptized. Is it really? (laughs) Yeah, that's the age of consent, according to a Mormon. Because, you know, child brides. What? So, okay, that's good. Let's let's talk to him about phrasing after we get off this record. Okay, (laughs) so when he was eight years old, he stole some candy. And then he went to church directly from stealing the candy. He stole candy on the way to church. So it wasn't working. And then the pastor made him feel really guilty and scared. So he was terrified. He went up, he gave the candy back. And that's when he knew he wanted to be a pastor. I really want to hear this story from the pastor's side. (laughs) He's like, so, you know, I'm doing my usual thing. Anybody want to come up? This kid comes up, starts sobbing, hands me a a loose handful of runts. And then I (laughs) I don't know what the fuck to do with those, but I put them in my pocket. That guy's a pastor now. So I don't know. I guess I did something right. Well, and here's the fucked up thing, too, is that he says the pet, but the, you know, I was expecting to get in all kind of trouble, but the pastor forgave me. And I'm like, He's not the one you stole the fucking candy from. It's not his candy. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> it is. It is, however, the perfect metaphor for Christianity, you're right, though. Where it's like <laughs> I harmed another person, and I just don't want to feel bad about it. And the pastor's like, "Poof, magic! Don't yep. feel bad about it." And he's like, "Oh, oh yeah, wow, I guess that I, was that's much better now." <laughs> I guess I could just stop feeling bad about it. <laughs> oh, she's to Sarah. Like, here's the story. She's like, "Wow, I really wish things had been that clear for me," but like. And we're an hour and 10 minutes into this movie and I still don't even know the fucking plot. So, yeah, I don't know. Uh, it's rough. <laughs> oh, yeah. Does Sarah not share her own story again, which is my life was a life and then I was Christian. And then he's like, <laughs> yeah. oh, let me let me put that testimony in my mouth. Like, it's so weird. <laughs> It's weird. Oh, and then she's like, why aren't you married? And he, he literally says the weirdest thing. He goes, I haven't married a woman yet. He's like, mm-hmm. Wait, what? <laughs> and I'm like, wait, what? What yeah, is I was he like, in? oh. <laughs> this movie caught my attention for a fraction of a second yeah, right, between right, that right. line and the next one. But he meant that he was married to the church. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And then and then her shitty kid comes out and he's like, Mom, I'm thirsty. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, he's literally like 17 years old. Yeah, and she, yes. we, we watch her go inside and pour him a glass of juice. It's the fucking saddest ending to a scene. Oh. Now, but right before that, though, we established that because she's basically she's telling the pastor, what am I going to do with the rest of this fucking movie? And he says, you got to go bother your friends in person about Christianity. So she's like, OK, cool. And then he agrees to watch the kids again. Again, if you read him as a pedophile, this is a horror movie and that's how you should read it. Why do you keep saying if? <laughs> or he's just like the luckiest pedophile ever. Well, right, he's yeah. just talking to like the best streak this pedophile ever oh, had. Geez. And then she trusted me with the kids again. It was time to. <laughs> oh, God. I'm telling you. Oh, no. Yeah, you're saying you got a lot of ass at Bonnaroo, but I'm telling you, this lady trusted me with her kids oh, three okay. weekends uh, so. in a row. <laughs> right, so. Now it's like <laughs> cutting you off. Coley, 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 quiet. Yeah. Stop talking, Coley. <laughs> and much like Coley, I chip myself. So, yeah, yes. we were all <laughs> full circle. All right, so yeah, so she drives on to the end of the movie, sort of. First, she goes to Atlanta to see Patrice. So the rest of the movie is her going to her various friends to Christianize them. Patrice is pretty much already there, right? So she doesn't have a a lot of resistance. This is like, you know, she plays it on novice level first. I was going to say she goes from like levels, right? She goes from least difficult to most difficult. Right. So, yeah, so she says, hey, Patrice, how you doing? And Patrice is like, I've been thinking about becoming Christian, but I didn't have a Christian friend to come pastor me about it is the problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we learned the reason that Patrice hasn't been Christian this whole time is she once fell in love with a white boy. Yeah. Yeah. This is weird. And she defied her family to love him. But then he wouldn't defy his family to love her. Yep. And that's why she hates Whitey. Yeah. Why? I don't. 
what is the point of that story? What are we supposed to gather from that? Oh, the point is for a white person to write those words for a black <laughs> <laughs> Okay. At right. one point, she's like, I brought him to my family. They did not care for him. I wanted her to be like, you know the type, huh? The usses. Yeah. <laughs> you know how we can be. Yeah. Real judgy. I did literally write. Yeah, I did literally write. Okay, I'm just now realizing this movie is really a white supremacist tame the black beast movie all dressed up. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I wrote in my notes, my family hated him because you know how racist black people are. <laughs> uh-huh. yeah. 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 But that is why she's been unable to trust white men, including Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> the whitest man of all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. right. Exactly. <laughs> And then Sarah explains that sometimes God sends you a philandering white guy. Sometimes he kills your friend in a car accident. He's wacky. And Patrice is like, right, wacky, get it. How do I Jesus from here? And she's like, why don't you drive? She lives in fucking Atlanta. She's like, why don't you drive to Charleston, South Carolina to get baptized? Oh, yeah, that's weird. That's quite an ask. Yep. That's a big fucking yeah. drive. <laughs> she's like, this weekend? Sure. Cool. No, oh, yeah, you know, I was not doing anything. No, I'm free. Yeah, I could do that. All right. So with Patrice sufficiently, I feel like she got cocky at this point, right? Sarah did. That one was so easy. She's like, you know what? I'm going straight to fucking Coley, straight to Coley. Mm -hmm. So she cranks the difficulty setting all the way up, goes to see Coley. And I, okay, we barely mentioned Grady, the driver as a character. I just want to point out that Grady has a different bizarre accent every time we see him. <laughs> really? I yep. didn't notice He that. will be an Irish immigrant uh, like understudying <laughs> Daniel Day Lewis at the beginning of the movie. Yep. He's, like, he's Carl the Puck of Pegacorn at this point in the movie. Kevin Spacey and Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil at a certain point. <laughs> yeah, it's just he's all over the fucking map. But so he lets uh, Sarah go up to talk to Coley. Coley's in bed sick. I love this moment. She's like, I'm sick. I have a fever. That's why I'm in bed. Sarah goes, you aren't sick. What? <laughs> How the fuck would You're you right. know that? You <laughs> And Coley's like, yeah, you got me. I'm not. Well, right. Yeah, <laughs> it's a hoax. Yeah, because it's them writing the movie. But how fucked up is it if she's just like, no, like, I'm serious. I run in a temperature of 103. I mean, cause I, what the fuck is wrong with Sick. you? I'll see you next week. <laughs> but no, no, she did. She's like, oh, I know you're right. COVID's not real. Anthony Fauci made it up because AIDS didn't kill enough people. I, 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 you got me. You yeah, got me. Right. No, you're sure. Yeah. yeah so uh, so she's like, you, you got to do something about being a drunk. And she's like, yeah, you know, I went to a couple of AA meetings. They don't seem to be working. To which Sarah says, well, how about we go to church instead of AA? And I'm like, wow, I guess it could get worse, couldn't it? <laughs> it's like AA, but with less useful stuff in community. <laughs> and the only Ooh. thing I wrote for this whole scene was, be strong, Coley, don't fall for her. <laughs> <laughs> she's my last hope, you guys. Yeah, right, right. And we think... So far, we think she's not going to because she's literally like, fuck you, get out of my room. Right. So, well, she's just kind of laughing along with it and everything. And I just, I'm, I'm loving Coley more and more the whole time. You know, Sarah's like, you know, all things are possible with God. And she's like, yeah, not getting me to turn Christian, though. So. <laughs> but Sarah leaves with Coley insufficiently Christianized. You know, that's, mm -hmm. that doesn't bode well for her in the Christian movie. But then we cut to Glenn's house where, okay. This is so delightful. Early on in this movie, I was scrolling through the IMDb page to look up some information on one of the actors. And I noticed that there was a person listed as FBI agent two. And the entire <laughs> fucking movie, I'm thinking to myself, how the fuck does the FBI get involved here? <laughs> Coley just opens up a giant suitcase of cocaine. I got y'all different gifts this year. <laughs> so... So an FBI agent is showing up to talk to Glenn's mom. This is so sloppy. That it's so bad. He explains that the guy she's been flirting with online is a secret international con artist under investigation by the FBI. You know, they tell a lot of people about the investigations they're doing randomly on porches. Uh, yeah, they give a lot of details <laughs> about really like, and, and you can kind of see the tape peeling off their shirt where they've covered up female <laughs> body investigator yep. mm -hmm. or inspector. Yeah. <laughs> so, so they explain that her internet boyfriend is a con artist and she should not date him. That's it. That's it. Yeah, like it tells her to the mom. To the mom, who, who could have been anyone? They don't like. I figure out her. I did. They're not like, ma'am. Can we see some ID? Nothing. No. 
They're like, is, is what's her name here? And she's like, no. And they're like, well, all right. Well, then we guess we'll fucking tell you. The, uh, <laughs> or the one, FBI really doesn't matter who has our information. <laughs> I don't know if you've heard any Citation Needed episodes, but we are not doing the work, if you know what I mean. Anyway, <laughs> here's your daughter's social security number and credit card. Last four digits of pin. All right, so, I'll talk to you later. <laughs> so, yeah, but so they leave. Glenn gets home. Oh, we we get a very brief scene of Coley getting to a bar to drink alcohol so that we know that the Christianity didn't stick. Oh, right. Yeah, right. she has a vodka straight up. Yeah. Oh, yeah. She's like, you know, I don't like ice. Yeah. Like, what? Like, <laughs> I'm a real alcoholic. It's supposed to be like a charming repartee, like a bartender, one poison, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So then we get Glenn getting home and her mom tells her off about the FBI agents, you know. And she uh, makes fun of her for being dumb enough to fall for a con artist. Oh, this is the meanest <laughs> She's such a bitch. In any movie I think I've ever seen. Like, she's legit. She's like, you are stupid and <laughs> sad she's so and awful. lonely. You deserve nothing. How could you have fallen for this? Only a weak piece of shit daughter. And you're like, whoa, this woman is abusive. And, and... I don't know that the movie thinks this woman is in the wrong. I think you're right. She never has a moment where she's like, I shouldn't do this. We will just no. see her at the very end of the movie sitting in the church. Happy. I think maybe this is supposed to be a, like a her getting what's good. Yeah, right. like like yeah. a good mom, like putting like laying down the law to her daughter who's just been running loose. Yes, exactly. <laughs> now, pop question. How much would you love this movie if she had straight up punched her mom in the face? <laughs> I mean, I thought she was about to. Right. So, so, so at the end of it, she goes, Mom, just once I wish you'd... And then she pauses for a long time. And I wrote my notes, die of a heart attack. Die of a heart attack. Just once. Just once. And Shove what, it up your ass. Shove it up your ass. Come on. What she eventually says is, shut up. And I'm like, oh. Come That's on. all she says. That's and then pussy. she walks away. Yep, like that was it. Puffing. I said meaner stuff about her mom in our fucking podcast. <laughs> Way meaner. <laughs> so, yeah. And, and so she runs off and, she, and the mom's like, where are you going? And she's like, to the next scene. And it turns out that the next scene <laughs> is her going to see Sarah and Pastor Rod at the mega church. Yeah. Oh, my God. And this is. This is the scene where Pastor Rod does the Ray Comfort impersonation. He right? does. He goes, <laughs> I wrote my notes. He's going full Ray Comfort. And then I was like, oh, I bet Eli's got that in his notes. And he does. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. She says, you know, she's like, well, you know, I'm a good person. I've never deliberately sinned. And he goes, well, have you ever told a lie? And I'm like, oh, really? Really? He's like, oh. have you ever used the Lord's name in vain? And I'm like, he's not going to go the lust. And he's like, <laughs> if you look at someone with lust in your eyes, I'm like, it's full no, Ray Comfort. <laughs> if he had unzipped himself and been Ray Comfort in that suit, <laughs> that's the only way that could have been better in that scene. Oh. I have weird things I get excited about. That's what I realized at that moment yeah. when I was like standing up ready to do the wave at this level of apologetic. <laughs> it's also worth noting that like the the belief versus works philosophy is core to conservative rejection of helping others. Yep. Like it's built into their theology that holding the Bible is more important than <laughs> helping people. Yeah. And it, when you look at it that way, it explains a lot that's going on in the world today. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> well, and, and what I love so much about this apologetic is that it's so bad for them, right? Because at the end of it, she's like, yeah, man, I've, I've lied and I've used the Lord's name in vain. He's like, well, then you're a sinner. And she's like, but everybody does those things. And then he goes into the, you know, which is why Jesus had to die for our sins. But like, if your moral code has everyone immoral, your moral code is useless. Right. True. Yeah, true. You need. What do you yeah. define as dirty? All things. Right. Okay, what do you <laughs> define as clean? Nobody. Your definition doesn't work, then. It's a useless term. But in their fucking stupid ass movie, she's like, oh, right. We are all sinners in the eyes right. of God. Wittgenstein walks in holding a bug. He's like, none of that makes any sense. <laughs> yeah, That's really bullshit. Any of these people that. have ever taken a philosophy class? Come on. No. Come on. No, the professor greeted everyone. They were like, I won't write a hate God on a piece of paper. And then they stormed out. And then he goes, I wasn't 
gonna, you know what? I'm Ask glad each, okay. you're gone. Yeah. <laughs> no, this, okay. This is an actual line. Speaking of the whole faith over works thing, this is an actual quote from the movie. The pastor says it because she's like, but I'm a good person. I run a woman's shelter. Literally everything we've seen me do in this movie has been like for other people, except flirting with the con artist guy. And the pastor says, and I quote, being good is good. It's great. But what we're really talking about here is faith in Jesus Christ. <laughs> okay. That is the movie's thesis. Uh-huh. Right? Yep. That's as, cl- as near as anything else. That's what this movie is about. Mm-hmm. Yep. Don't let all your good deeds get in the way of your belief in Jesus Christ. Yep. Exactly. This movie. So Glenn says, you know what? I will think about being Christian. And Sarah says, again, I quote, don't just think about it. Pray about it. I'm like, yeah, thinking is not going to do the trick for these guys. (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) Wishing in your head way better. That's going to that's going to work out way better for the Christians. And then they're trying to talk Glenn into they're giving her the hard sell. They're like, no, no, no. If you walk out of here today, the price of your salvation goes up by 25 percent. I can only offer this deal till the end of till, till the close of business tonight. Right. Look, I tell you what. Let me go in the back and talk to God and see if I can get you a deal. <laughs> you said discount on that undercoating. Yeah. So but <laughs> Glenn says, wait, wait, I was baptized as a kid. Does that still count? And Rod goes, no, <laughs> no, no, it doesn't. Oh, yeah, this is like a new one for me. Yeah, it's a new one for Christianity, too, because it's supposed to fucking count. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he's like, that was your parents baptizing you for them. Right, committing to raising you in the faith. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but now you need to do it. And I'm like, oh, oh, so this this way they can get like a double baptism fee off of all of their their patrons. Yeah. And it's like, no, no, let me explain that baptism thing. When you were a baby, that was just so that we could tell certain people their baby was in hell. This baptism, <laughs> that's the real one. This is the one that that counts. Yeah. Exactly. Again, my manager, get, he has to go to lunch in a couple of minutes. So if we could lock this down before then, I need his <laughs> signature. <laughs> well, and then, and then Glenn says again, and I'm sorry to quote the fucking movie so many times in a row, but Glenn says, please help me with my lack of faith to them. And they all pray together. Now, This is when the movie reveals itself to be this very weird kind of evangelical porn that we've seen so much of that. And and I'm assuming that Kara has not seen so much of (laughs) when you're an evangelical Christian or a missionary. What you're used to is talking about your religion, people telling you to fuck off and never wanting to talk to you again. So this is one of the many little porn fantasies they have about. But what if one time it worked, though? Right, right. The whole point of this movie is to have your haughty friend who thinks it's good enough that she runs a woman's shelter actually say to you vicariously through Sarah, help me with my lack of faith. Yes, in those actual words. Yep. And I just want to be fair to porn here. Like, someone's probably blown a pizza guy. I don't think it's fair to compare (laughs) the goals of porn. (laughs) Okay. No, you're right. You're right. I'm giving porn a bad (laughs) name. I'm saying very mean things about porn there. All right. So now we cut to Coley being loaded in an ambulance because of her alcohol overdose. (laughs) Or I I guess she she had taken pills too. Yeah. Noah, do you have any fun facts about this uh, scene? (laughs) I don't know that they need to be. Yeah, actually, the uh, so so the actor who played Sarah, the main character, she actually died in February of this year from uh, complications from chronic alcoholism. So this is, uh, this is some serious shit, guys. Let's Are see. you serious? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Forty four so years the one old. Who played Sarah? Yeah, forty four year old woman, like younger than me. That's, yeah. So the whole time, yep, that she is being so fucking judgmental to this other actor's character inside, she's dying. Yes, yep. because she's like, I'm talking to myself. Yep. Right. It's the perfect metaphor for Christianity. <laughs> <laughs> so, right. That is like Ooh. the darkest shit. Yeah, mm-hmm. I know. Oh, my God. I wrote it in my notes. I wasn't really sure about saying it on the show, but he like hosted <laughs> it out of me. So. No, that's like really dark. Right. Wow. Why did she take this job? It's funny, though, if you think about it. You got to really think about it. It's yeah, funny, it's a- though. <laughs> <laughs> Eli, you're such a piece of shit. Because <laughs> no, her daughter did an Instagram post about it. It's, it's funny if you guys got to see it from the right All angle. right. All right. <laughs> M- moving right along. So terror facing theory. I win. 
This is way better than my note, which is she's one of those people, the kind that leave their <laughs> phone ringers on. Yes, oh, right, right. Yeah, so Sarah and Pastor Rod are chatting about their last scene together when she gets a call from uh, about Coley having OD'd on, on pills, right? So the pastor's like, don't worry, the writers aren't going to kill off two of your friends in the same fucking movie, right? That'd be repetitive at this point. Let's go to the hospital. I'm sure it'll be fine. So we go to the hospital. Rod, Sarah, Patrice, Glenn, and no fucking buddy else is in the waiting room waiting for her. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're right. Yep, yep. The doctor comes in and says, are you guys family? And they all say yes. And of course, that's supposed to be funny because Patrice is black. How she could, could she be in their family? Literally, as they play that for a fucking joke. Mm -hmm. And then the doctor's like, OK, well, you guys just said you were family. I guess I can release all of her medical information to you. <laughs> Let me tell you how many pills she took in her suicide attempt. Yeah. Yeah, that was weird, too, because he said he found them in her. <laughs> like, <Yeah. laughs> he, he didn't say where. He was, yeah, he wasn't like. This is just so stupid. He was it thirty pills. I'm trying yeah, to remember. Uh -huh, thirty. Pills. He wasn't like we found an empty bottle that had that should have had thirty pills. He was like opened her up, saw thirty pills. Yeah, like, we counted them. The autopsy. A lot like, of people don't do exploratory <laughs> surgery on an alcohol overdose, but I'm I'm a doctor who lives on the edge. Like a, like a fucking deer, somebody just shot. Like look at all the grass in her stomach. Yeah. Like what? Also, she had shrimp for lunch. Just so you guys know that. And it's there too. So weird. <laughs> so yeah, he says the, the doctor's like, you know, we're gonna keep her here. She's gonna need some psychological help. And I and and Sarah looks at him like, I think you're underestimating the power of Jesus. <laughs> she says, Well, can we come see her? And he's like, All right, but only two at a time and only for five minutes. And I'm like, okay, that's fucking weird. And Sarah and Rod go first. She does yeah, not weird. know Rod. <laughs> she also doesn't really like say no right <laughs> i think the friend who she's least close with and her not boyfriend should talk to her yes first. <laughs> that's so fucking weird and so they go out back to sierra i love that they we, we linger on patrice and glenn for just a, a second so uh patrice can go like i hear you're getting baptized and glenn's like yeah i hear you're getting baptized she's like yeah and, and the only thing I could think of was that Coley was going to get sponge bapt. <laughs> <laughs> I'd watch it. I'd watch it. <laughs> I can't. It was so funny to me while I was watching this at like three in the morning. <laughs> All right. So. <laughs> All right, so we follow Sarah and Pastor Rod back. Coley's in bed again, you know, because she's lazy. And uh, I, I so wanted Sarah to give her the same you're not really sick bullshit. Come on. <laughs> With the IV in her hand. Still faking that fever thing? Gosh, yes. Coley. <laughs> So, okay, so, but Coley's like, no offense, Sarah, but can you leave me alone with your boyfriend? And, and Sarah's like, oh, yeah, I so wanted her to blow the pastor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Come here, honey. Let Coley show you a thing or two. And Sarah's like into it, too. She's like, yeah, get the spirit. Like, yeah. Yes, right, right, right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So Pastor Rod and Coley have their, like, come to Jesus moment, right? Like, because apparently, you know, Sarah couldn't quite make a Christian out of her, so she has to tag in a professional, right? Right, and Coley's just down, too. She doesn't give a shit. But what I love is that during this, like, heartfelt exchange where Pastor Rod is, like, describing his own drunk mother who, like, ruined his life, and Coley's crying, like, I don't want that to be me. Somebody flushed a toilet. Like, did you guys <laughs> So hear fucking yes. loud. And in the most intense part of the movie. Yes. Like, he's, liter he's literally like, and she died. Alone and a yeah. <laughs> See, the audio person wasn't like, can we? Oh man, I just took a giant shit. Let me tell you that. All right, now how about we shoot this fucking scene for this movie, huh? Forget I'll about tell you. I'm Italian. Hey, it's me, Tony D. So, nobody go in there because I just took a shit in there. <laughs> now, why don't we make a movie? <laughs> so yeah, so he gives her this whole you remind me of my pathetic alcoholic dead mom speech. He's like, but don't worry, it's not too late for you. I brought you a Bible. Yeah. Um, and he says, he goes, this is again, admitting what bullshit their thing is. He says, now you don't have to read the whole thing. I'm like, it would be, it's like 70 hours to read the fucking Bible. Maybe a little more than that. Like, it's the word of fucking God, according to you people. Was, why would you not read the whole goddamn thing? <laughs> that's what I was going to say. It's like, why? 
Why would you not read the whole of the word of God? Because he's literally like, you don't actually have to love God. You just have to like cheat and lie about it. Right. Let him know the difference. Let him see you looking at it time to time. Yeah. (laughs) And then then just raise your hand up at church and say, I accept Jesus into my heart. And like, literally, you could be a a kitty fiddler. It doesn't matter. They don't care about me being a kitty fiddler. It does not matter. (laughs) We have figured out the system. Stuff. But the thing that bothers me the most about the scene, and I shouldn't even have to say this, is that literally not a single person in this movie has the empathy to realize that Coley is legitimately sick and needs help. Yeah. Like, she needs therapy. Not Jesus. <laughs> exactly. And it's all the sadder when you think about how common this exact scenario is, is where, when people genuinely need therapy and get Christianity instead. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, so now we're, we're we're done with the hospital. She's cured. Coley is cured. She has a Bible in her hand and 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 loves Jesus, and she's going to get baptized now. We're done. Yeah, with don't that. worry. There's no such thing as withdrawal with alcohol. No, and it's only <laughs> not dangerous. So yeah, she'll be fine. No recidivism or anything like that. No, yeah, she's she yeah, yeah. got Jesus now. She'll be fine. So much so that we're literally done with that plot line. But we have to add a new one. <laughs> oh, yeah, like in the last ten minutes of the movie. I don't. Get this. This is so fucking insane. My only theory is that this scene was supposed to be, thanks so much for watching the kids, no problem. And this actress was just like, I want you to know that I told a bunch of other churches that you and the pastor are dating, and I'm sorry that I crossed you because we're best friends who grew up in elementary school together until you killed my cat, Misty. (laughs) It's so (laughs) weird. I was like, okay, so she starts talking about like, she says, I have a confession to make to you, Sarah. When I saw you with Pastor Rod, who I have a crush on, I got very jealous. And I'm like, oh, my God, please tell me she poisoned Coley to get revenge against Sarah. <laughs> and that she's the one that ran Gracie off the road at the beginning. But no. Wait, and by she, by the way, none, I don't think either of you have said who she is. Oh, right. Yeah, no. She, she is Daisy, the church secretary. Who's super gossipy and always giving everybody side eye. Yeah, the one that gave her the dirty look earlier. We had you put a pin in that, remember? Yeah, mm-hmm. right. Oh. Yeah, But no, the entire thing is I called some other churches and I dropped some rumors about the two of you being very close. Is that what she was admitting to? I thought she called like the the head pastor to get Pastor Rod fired. That's why I was so concerned that like not concerned. I wasn't actually concerned. I don't give two shits. But that's why I was so confused. <laughs> well, I was temporarily involved in this movie <laughs> yeah, for a second. That nothing comes of this scene. So that may be the case. I honestly couldn't. I you know I I the whole thing in my notes is what is the goddamn conflict here? <laughs> I don't right. understand. It's a, it's a weird and unnecessary scene, and also Daisy looks like she might murder Sarah. Yes, uh-huh. on the fence. Yep. So, okay, so everybody goes to the church for the big baptism. There's this moment where, like, I guess what we're supposed to think now, and I only know this in retrospect, is that Sarah assumes that the pastor wants to break up with her now, but the pastor wants to propose to her now. Classic. Yeah, they never make explicit why. Oh, oh, I see. So, okay, here's the line of reasoning. Mm -hmm. Daisy tells Sarah, I saw that you guys were canoodling. I tattletailed on you. Sarah's like, shit, that must have gotten back to the pastor. His dick got soft, and now he wants to break up with me. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. And so when she runs into the, and you know it's a creepy mega church because he's wearing the fucking creepy little headphone, like microphone thing that's like uh taped to his face that just, oh, it makes him extra (laughs) pedo-y. And she's like walking past him. To be on stage for, by the way, literally no reason. She does nothing at all. Just stands does there nothing. in a nope. very, very short dress, shaking back and forth occasionally. Yes. Behind a microphone that she never uses. Yep. Nope. It's really nothing weird. It, she doesn't sing. She doesn't offer testimony. Nothing. Yeah. And he's going like, Psst, Sarah, Psst, hey, I got to talk to you. I want to talk to you. And she's like, Fuck off. I know what this is about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, that's the scene. The longer yep. I won't talk to you, the longer we're technically not broken up. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. But the all the Psst, I need to talk to you shit eventually culminates in the pastor whisper proposing to her, but just as the music ends and everyone can hear it. 
Yeah, which is weird. It's weird that their church music ends with a record scratch, but it does work for the movie. <laughs> Why the fuck would you be trying to ps- ps- whisper your proposal to someone? Yeah. You think they're going to get married before the fucking service is over? You're going to miss your window? <laughs> yeah, it's like it's one of two things. Either he's going to do it intentionally on stage, which is the fucking worst. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. PSA right now. Any motherfuckers out there who think it's a good idea to propose in public in front of a live studio audience, it's not. No. It's never a good idea. That's always a terrible idea that will ruin her life. Oh, I disagree. I disagree. <laughs> you should propose in the most embarrassing and horrible way possible. Bring her to a dinner theater in Bayonne, <laughs> New Jersey. Right. Wait until someone else is proposing and interrupt to propose. <laughs> here's the thing. That's fucking forever. Right. Everyone went to our first date spot and he pulled in his sham and and but er- no one's going to be like, I was having really bad diarrhea and he kicked open the door and proposed. <laughs> so, Think about it, people. All right. No, that's a good one, though. Who you that's, trust? You, because you have some privacy there. No, honestly, everyone should say no to every public proposal until people learn not to do that shit. That's fucking awful. <laughs> But the way this movie plays out, of course, she says, yes, the crowd erupts. It's not scandalous anymore. It's just, it's all fine. Yeah, all her weirdly wet friends run out from backstage <laughs> yeah, exactly. to give her wet baptized hugs and <laughs> the spirits dripping all over them. And it's fucking <laughs> disgusting and pornographic. I hate this movie so much. I was going to say, you should start writing the porn with me, Karen. I was good there at the end. <laughs> yeah, the good news, though, is that it is over we made it Kara thank you so much for hanging out with us through this shit fest Mm -hmm. and one more time just in case we have very forgetful memento style listeners can you remind our audience (laughs) the best place to go to find more Kara Santa Maria okay it's a really tough one it's Kara Santa Maria dot com aka I love skin books (laughs) (laughs) dot com All right, well, well, that's going to do it for our review of Only God Can. That's not going to do it for the episode just yet because we still need to lure you back. So, Eli, tell us what's on deck. Well, no, we're going to be joined by Jessica from over at The Friendly Atheist to review the 1968 educational film, A Teenage Conflict. It's about how Richard Feynman can go fuck himself. Smart people all believe in Jesus. (laughs) (laughs) That's that's exactly what it's about, too. All right, so with that to look forward to, we're going to bring episode 313 to a merciful close. Once again, a huge thanks to Kara and perhaps even a huger thanks to all the Patreon donors that help make the show go. If you'd like to count yourself among their ranks, you can make a per-episode donation at patreon.com slash godawful and thereby earn early access to an ad-free version of every episode. You can also help a ton by leaving a five-star review and by sharing the show on all your various social media platforms. And if you enjoyed this show, be sure to check out our sibling show, The Scathing A, The Citation Need, D&D Minus, and The Skeptic Ground, available wherever podcasts live. If you have questions, comments, or cinematic suggestions, you can email godawfulmovies at gmail.com. Legal services for this podcast are provided by the law offices of P. Andrew Torres. Tim Robinson takes care of our social media. Our theme song was written and performed by Ryan Slot, Eviva Drafts on Mars. All of the music was written and performed by our audio engineer, Morgan Clark, and was used with permission. Thanks again for giving us a chunk of your life this week. For Heath Enright, Neil, I boss, I'm no illusions, promise to work hard to earn another chunk next week. Until then, we'll leave you with the Breakfast Club close. And then the storm of the century struck Charleston. Everyone died. Nobody gave a fuck. (laughs) (laughs) Patrice went on to realize that all lives did matter. (laughs) Jesus Christ. Pastor Hot Rod molested the shit out of those kids. Yeah. Yeah, we saw that coming. Yeah. (laughs) The preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2021. All rights reserved.